Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the channel. I'm doing an interview today with Mark Turry. How are you, Mark? I'm good, Aaron. How are you? Good. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Yeah, Turi. Turi is fine, either or. <laughs> Turi. So that's a Hungarian name, huh? That's right. Yeah. My dad was uh, Hungarian, and uh, that's where I live now. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's been interesting <laughs> learning the language, for sure. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I interviewed um, Sabrina David last week, and mm -hmm. she was on staff in Berlin for a long time. And yeah. you were on staff in Berlin uh, at the same time that she was. Is that right? That's right. That's correct. Yeah, I was on staff from uh, May 2007 till February 2008. So is that on staff just in Berlin? Or is that that because weren't you in San Francisco as well? I was. Yeah. So um, when I was left Berlin in February of 2008, I was what I thought was transferred to San Francisco to finish nine months of a two and a half year contract. Um, but once I got there to San Francisco day org, um, and I was only there for about two and a half months. Um, but then it turned out that I had to sign a new contract. And so I guess I really wasn't on staff in Berlin. And that's another thing. Because uh, uh, I, I can get into that later on uh, what happened, why I left San Francisco, which is kind of bonkers, to be honest with you. But um, that's that's the story. So I guess I was just shy of a year as a staff member, you know, two weeks shy of a year in total um, from two. Yeah. From May 2007 till May 2008. Got it. Where should we actually start here? Well, how did you get into Scientology? When did you get into Scientology? So I got into Scientology in May of 2005 when I was on vacation in Los Angeles and I was doing the tourist thing in Hollywood and I actually was body rooted into the L. Ron Hubbard Life Exhibition at 6331 Hollywood Boulevard and you know previous to that I had um, been looking for something like most you know like most um People who get into Scientology, I was pretty much um, very similar, looking for a different religion or something to do. And um, I had just graduated from college um, and I was kind of trying to find out where I fit in the world. My job prospects weren't going very well in my personal life. Actually, my parents had gotten divorced and my grandmother died very close to each other time wise. So I wasn't feeling very great. And it was my first time in Los Angeles. Um, and that was making me feel better. And I guess they just kind of got me at the wrong place at the wrong time for me. Um, and I went through the L. Ron Hubbard Life ex uh, exhibit. I asked a bunch of questions. And of course, everything I asked about was turned in a way that was positive and really good. And I guess I just, I was very curious. And I sort of got into that after that. Um, the exact same day, just a few minutes later, after I left the L. Ron Hubbard Life ex uh, Exhibition, I actually was then body rooted into the LA Test Center, which used to be maybe like half a mile uh, away from the Guarantee Building. And that's when I did the OCA and did some of those more steps that most people take to get them in the org, you know, my, found my ruin. Um, and then I bought a bunch of books. And I guess the sort of part of why I got in was just because I bought books I was reading and then I discovered the org in Toronto and went there and, and then started my courses. Um, so, you know, it, it was really, uh, was really being at the wrong place at the wrong time, I think, and having kind of the wrong um, way to express some of the depression and anger that I was feeling with some of these things that were going on in my personal life. You know, getting into Scientology was unhealthy, but at the time I thought that they could help me and I made that step. I see. So, and when you were visiting Los Angeles, uh, mm -hmm. that was from Toronto, was Toronto where you were living? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're Canadian, born and raised in Canada? That's correct. Yes. Okay. And so mm -hmm. then if you're just on vacation in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. you get body routed in to see the LRH Life exhibit. Mm -hmm. uh, they take you down the street to the test center. You don't spend like the rest of your vacation on course, do you? Oh, no, no, no. That that was the thing. But I did spend the rest of my, of my vacation reading the books and the booklets that I had bought. 
So I ended up buying from the, you probably know, I'm sure you remember the um, volunteer minister handbook. They had these booklets that were sold. They were chapters in the volunteer minister's handbook, but they were sold separately as booklets. So I bought the communications booklet, the study tech booklet, and then the problems of work booklet. I then also ended up buying a copy of Dianetics and self-analysis. So I spent the rest of my time there while I was doing all my touristy things, reading. And then um, I also like think I bought a DVD. And so I watched that DVD when I had come home from Los Angeles. And that led me to call the Toronto Org. So it took maybe less than a week by the time I had actually, you know, discovered Scientology, been reading and then kind of joined course, maybe two weeks, actually, now that I think of it. But in a very small period of time, I had done a lot of that introductory reading um, from these introductory materials. And then I think it was just shy of two weeks when I actually started courses in Toronto. And that would have been in the later part of May 2005. Very interesting. Yeah. So, okay, around this time, 2005, that would have been peak Tom Cruise Scientology Mania yes. War of the World period. Oh, yes. Um, what mm -hmm. did you already know or had you already heard about Scientology before running into it on Hollywood Boulevard? So just a little bit. Um, when I was growing up, uh, uh, my father, his best friend, had a sister, she grew up in Montreal, and she apparently had been a Scientologist and moved to Los Angeles and married an American and was in LA for like 10 years. So we always had that rumbling of like, what we would mention my dad's friends, him growing up, he would mention this person. So that was kind of like a rumbling. But I don't know if you remember this, Aaron, back in, I think like 1998 or nine, maybe 2000, Entertainment Tonight did like a four or five part little piece on the Celebrity Center International. And Leah was actually in that uh, series. Um, she was a Scientologist. Of course, she was promoting Scientology. There was something about the Celebrity Center. So I remember watching this four or five part series and then going to the internet. Now the internet for, for my family, we had like just got the internet, just got access. So it was very, very new. And I did type Scientology into Google and I can't recall exactly even to this day what I necessarily saw or read, but I was also like 15 and 16 years old, somewhere around there. I didn't have a car. I couldn't really get into Scientology, even though I may have been interested in it. And so I guess I read something. Um, I know that I joined, do you remember alt.religion.scientology? That group, I actually joined that group very, very briefly, which later would come, come back. Um, that's a San Francisco story. Um, and just very briefly, and for whatever reason, I put it out of my head. I couldn't go downtown to the org. I was a teenager. When Battlefield Earth came out, there was a resurgence in Scientology. So I probably read some stuff about it. I read the book at the time. I saw the movie, which was awful. Um, you know what I mean? Like there, it came back into popular media. And I don't exactly recall what it was I would have seen, but I know I was probably exposed to N theta. And so um, in 2005, I just sort of put that stuff at the back of my head because the people that I was introduced to and, you know, being in Los Angeles, um, they seemed very confident. They seemed, you know, very, very friendly, very um, dedicated. And I guess I sort of put it in my head like, well, that's all stuff on the internet. Um, they're telling me things about Scientology that I had never known. Like I didn't know, I was being introduced to the eight dynamics. I was being introduced to the ARC triangle and the internet never told me that. The internet never really told me what, what they actually believed in. And so I think what that did is it made me mistrust some of the criticisms and it made me trust the Scientologists more. And then I, I shoved it to the back of my head, like, yeah, okay, some people call it a cult. But that didn't really mean anything because I had my personal experience. At the time it was 
becoming positive at least. And so I just went with what I thought were my instincts and started taking courses and ignored all that other stuff that I would have seen at that point, five to seven years prior. Um, so that's really like how I, how I think about it now. I think even then, if you had asked me, what did I read in the late nineties? And, and it would have been like 2005. I probably couldn't be very specific other than, yeah, I was aware of Xenu.net. I was aware of ARS, but that was probably all. Interesting. Yeah. So it's true. If, if all you know of Scientology is what you've seen online, you might think that Scientology is all about Xenu and sec checking. Yeah. <laughs> and again, most people, I know you've discussed this too. Most people don't know who Xenu is. They've never gotten to OT3. It's a very specific thing. It's like, it's, it's not really what Scientology is necessarily all about, but it is hidden within this level and it's hidden from the public. And it's probably also hidden from regular Scientologists like who aren't even clear because of the fact that it's pretty silly. Leah has, I, 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 I watched her um, re, uh, talk about her reactions on Joe Rogan. Um, there's a 15 minute clip out there when she was on Joe Rogan, I think a few years back and how she reacted to the Xenu story. Again, it would make people walk, but because she was in there and her mother was in there and people have to be very dedicated to get to that level, it keeps them in a little bit longer because it's so hard to leave after that point. But, you know, it also is one of like a hundred things that's wrong with the church. It's not just Xenu. It's not just that they're hiding Xenu. It's like, there's the abuses. There's things that I experienced at the bottom of the barrel <laughs> kind of level that were worse. And so it's good to bring up Xenu, but to make everything about that is kind of a little disconcerting to people that never were OT, never were going to be OT because there are so many other things that are, you know, wrong about the church uh, morally uh, and pragmatically and all that kind of stuff as well. So it's nice yeah. to know, it's nice to make fun, but it's, it's not really what it's all about necessarily. Yeah. I think the other thing that's wrong with people thinking that's what Scientology is all about is it makes mm -hmm. it very easy to go you have to be fucking stupid or desperate to get into Scientology yeah. when and the thing that I think is harmful about people having that idea is if you think something like this could never happen to you then it's more likely to happen to you <laughs> yeah because I understand I didn't... how reasonable people end up getting into something like this. If you actually truly understand how that happened, mm -hmm. then it's less likely to happen to you. But if you think mm -hmm. it can't happen to you, I would argue it's more likely. So I'm sorry, go ahead. You were saying. Apology. <laughs> um, I did not wake up that it was a Saturday morning in May 2005. I did not wake up that morning thinking that I would become a Scientologist or be interested by, you know, sundown that same day. Um, it was not something that was on my mind. And even when I walked into the L. Ron Hubbard Life exhibition, I had heard the name L. Ron Hubbard. I had heard the name Scientology. I felt apprehensive. But they, the people that were there, were very good at disarming me of that skepticism and apprehension. And it's tactics that can work on anybody. And, you know, yeah, you're not people who are Scientologists. I've met people across all different cultures languages, um, religious backgrounds, um, you know, it, it can it can happen to anybody in a sense, you've got to be in a particular mindset, which I was, unfortunately, and this is excluding people who are born and raised into it. But those who get recruited from, you know, an age of adulthood, or at least close to adulthood, you do have to be in sort of a place. And if you're not in that place, if you are happy with your family if you've got a great job like Scientologists they don't really take those people too much they kind of look for people with ruins and they will find it and they will exploit it and then they will sell you on the fact that this is the only way and someone like me I tried a whole bunch of different things you know to get over some of my anger issues and 
depression issues and I didn't feel that it was working. So I thought Scientology was just another way of trying to cope with these things. And then you get sucked into it. So it's a step-by-step -step process. It's not like they have a target on certain people that they're looking for. They take in a massive amount of people and a small amount are, you know, stay and a large amount are filtered out. But you really do have to be in a particular place um, mentally, I think, uh, in some ways um, to, to, be, to gravitate towards that, at least, again, from my experience as someone who was 22. Um, you know, I have to exclude the people that were born and raised in, in, in the church. But that's, that's what happened to me. And it was just, I was sold on it. What can I say? You know, I was sold on their pitch. I believed in it. And I tried it. And of course, everything is step by step. So, oh, just try this now. You know, if it doesn't work, something will down the road. Okay, try, you know, it's not, it's not like one step. It's small little steps that get you from, you know, from being just a public to, you know, maybe being a staff member in the Sea Org. Like, that's sort of how I try to explain it. It's just small little things. Yeah. So give me um, like one example of something that, at these lower introductory levels of Scientology, mm -hmm. you found appealing and attractive? Well, I really liked self-analysis. Um, when I bought the book Self-Analysis, it came, this is pre-basics. So it came with like, a, um, almost like a bookmark and it had a list of things that you were supposed to sort of look at and ask questions about. Now it's been a long time, so my specifics might be a little rough, but there, there was a kind of a practical application of, self-analysis. Um, Dianetics was another one. I had Dianetics and Dianetics came with that thing that looked like a ruler, like a bookmark, where you could audit someone else. There was something practical. Uh, it seemed like there was something pragmatic. I also started my very first course, which was the Hubbard Dianetics Seminar. And that seemed to be very practical and very pragmatic. It, I was twinning doing Dianetics auditing with other students. And I felt especially during auditing, that I felt very good. Um, I would say my first, really my first big win and probably my only big win came during my first Dianetics auditing session um, because I was on um, the HDS course and I got my first session and I was really um, emotional with these issues. Like I, I was frustrated with my parents. I was frustrated with the fact that I had graduated and had no jobs. I was very, very frustrated. I was frustrated I didn't quit my community college program a year or two years before and sort of taken control of my own life. And so I went into session with a lot of these sort of memories and past things. And I remember being keyed out at the end of that session and feeling on top of the world. Um, and then, you know, doing these little things in self-analysis and then reading about Dianetics and then doing the course, it just seemed to be something that really, really worked. And for whatever reason, the public itself rejected it or didn't know about it. And it was sort of my goal and the goal of Scientology to get that information out because if it was working for me, it can work for other people. And then it started to become about other people. And it started to, you know, maybe I can audit my mom one day. Maybe I have friends that I can audit one day. Maybe it would help them if they had this technology. And then that sort of proselytizing kind of starts where everyone sort of needs the same thing, which is Dianetics. And that's the conclusion. Everybody needs it. Doesn't matter who they are. It's one size fits all. It worked for me. It'll work for you. Um, and kind of, became a little fanatical about that too, a little extreme, but I really, I really had a benefit. I really had a benefit and a win on Dianetics. And that for me at least was, was the first thing that worked for me. And it was probably the only thing after that, it was downhill as far as wins. As I did a lot of other courses, never felt the same way as I did on that first day. Um, and I think that's that's the downside of Scientology, and that's how they they you know that's how you're manipulated as well into doing more. Um, but certainly, one thing worked, and that was about all <laughs> for me. Yeah. You know. <laughs> okay, so you're talking about the auditing, and again, because um, what's so popular about Scientology online is Xenu and sect checking. 
I run into the fact that popularly people seem to think that all auditing is, is interrogating someone to find out embarrassing things about them so that they can be yeah. blackmailed to stay in Scientology. And I think that contributes to people not understanding um, how, what it is about auditing that people can find um, addictive or desirable mm -hmm. and how that comes into play at the lower levels. I don't claim to have any particular, uh, particularly good theories about what it is about auditing that creates this feeling of euphoria. But even when you mentioned self-analysis, I'm mm -hmm. not sure people are even going to understand that particularly. But like, so self-analysis is essentially a book with almost auditing questions that you're supposed to, it's really auditing yourself. Right. So you're doing self-analysis, you're auditing yourself. That then leads into Dianetics auditing which is a one-on-one -on -one auditing and it's a different kind of auditing. But, um, um, but maybe like give, give the, the viewers a little bit of an idea of what self-analysis, you know, I don't want to get too much into details about the auditing because I'm not sure people really yeah. care, but let's try to give them a taste of how auditing is different than what people understand sec checking to be. Like, what is it that's okay. attractive? Mm -hmm. How does it make you feel or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, auditing, I was a, you know, a fully trained Dynex auditor. I, after the seminar, I did the actual course. So, and I did 20 hundreds of hours of twinning a Dynex auditor. Um, so Dianetics auditing is really looking back to your past. Um, of course, you think it's on your whole track, but then it goes all the way back to the whole track eventually. But really what it's about is going back to your past, finding memories that were traumatic, repeating them in a certain process, and then as you're repeating them, as the auditor is asking you questions, details about colors and smells and all these kind of things, you're supposed to get a cognition, which means you're supposed to become happier. And the whole thing has to do with the reactive mind. Sec check doesn't have anything to do with that. Sec check is just asking you questions from a list to make sure that you're in ethics, your morals are okay. They're looking at the floating needle. Um, you know, it's a lot more technical. And of course, I've had sec checks on me as well in Berlin and, and San Francisco. But auditing is really like the first thing that you do. And it's really the first step of indoctrination because they get you to believe that you have an analytical mind and a reactive mind. And that comes from Dianetics. You don't, unfortunately, but that's what they believe. So when you're doing these courses, they will tell you your reactive mind, whenever you do something rational or you're planning or something that you do that, you know, uh, is analytical, it's from the analytical mind. But when you have a trauma, whether you're conscious of it or not, these engrams, these sounds, these smells, these tastes, they get lodged in your reactive mind. And the only way that you can get rid of that reactive mind and live a better life and live a life that is whole and happy is to go through auditing because auditing will clear your engrams and clear your reactive mind, hence the term clear. And there's different types of clears. There are Dianex clears and of course there's Scientology clears because there's the grades and that's a whole different thing which I didn't get onto. But the idea is to give the person the idea that you've got two minds and that that mind that has been holding you back is your reactive mind. And the example I like to give or the example that, that is given in the courses. As a child, let's say we're out riding your bike and you fell and a neighbor screamed something about, you know, not being able to breathe or, or they're hurt or they're in pain. The idea is when you are in that trauma, when you fall off your bike and you know that you're experiencing a physical pain, your analytical mind shuts off and your reactive mind takes over. So everything that the neighbors say, all the sounds, let's say a car drives by, everything is going to be recorded 100%. And it's not going to go to your analytical mind. It's going to go to your reactive mind. So then the next time something happens, when you go through a trauma, and whatever the neighbor said, the neighbor's wife said, or whatever, will re-stimulate you, will trigger you, and it will cause your reactive mind to come back into you, and then you'll carry this trauma. Another example is of drowning. It's very common to say he can't breathe or she can't breathe. 
and then the reactive mind takes over. And so that engram is that they can't breathe. L. Ron Hubbard believed that was where asthma came from. So there's all these different things that are kind of connected in this, in this pseudoscientific kind of thing, like the reactive mind. And that's really what they're trying to do. They're trying to, they are trying to make it so you aren't as triggered to certain traumas. But the way they do it is very much in a, in a way that's just not proven and not provable. Um, and it really comes down to just being indoctrinated. And I think that when people like me, again, looking at things like sec checks and solo auditing, that's not what the regular Scientologist does. I mean, uh, you get in on Dianetics, you learn these things about the reactive mind, you learn about engrams, you learn about how engrams are connected to illnesses, cancers, asthma, bronchitis, etc. And you learn that if you don't have a reactive mind and you clear your engrams, you can have restored vision if you don't have 20-20 vision. You learn that you can never get cancer. You learn that if you have asthma, you can get rid of asthma. So those are the, those are the claims at the beginning. The sec check stuff happens when you are long down the line and the interrogations, do they happen for sure? But your average Scientologist, especially getting in, is really probably not going to necessarily focus on that sec check stuff. I mean, I never got sec check till I was on staff. Um, and nobody's really worried about that. You're just sort of focusing on the Dianetics stuff. And that, that is the thing that gets people. That's the, the carrot. That's your first carrot because wins can happen. You can get some good benefits from Dianetics. Um, they don't have anything to do necessarily with your reactive mind and, and analytical mind, but that's really what is sold at the beginning. And that's really why people are there. Yeah, you know, I think, and I haven't even thought about it in these terms until recently. I think it's the fact that most auditing sessions end with this, what I think you could call a euphoric feeling mm -hmm. of some degree or another. And that these auditing sessions occur very early on in your Scientology experience. And there's something about this feeling of euphoria that accompanies an auditing session that makes it seem, oh, this is true. This <laughs> is real. This is effective. And it immediately dovetails in with this conspiracy theory that the reason Scientology is so attacked is because it's so effective and it can help people and it's cheap. I mean, at the lower levels, it's cheap. And, the lower and, therefore, levels are cheap. <laughs> and therefore psychiatry opposes us, psychology opposes us, the government opposes us, um, all the institutions that control the world oppose us because we pose a threat to them because we can make people better. We can make people stronger. And that's the last thing that people who control the world want. And it all comes down mm. to this feeling of euphoria that comes about in an auditing session. I mean, does that sound right to you? You know, that euphoria is also a good way to put in someone uh, in, into an idea. Like when you feel euphoric, that's Scientology working. So the evidence is, did you feel euphoria? Yes, that means it works. And I think what happens maybe chemically in the brain or something where there's some suggestion that is made because I do believe a lot of Dianetics is hypnotism, at least in some ways. It can be hypnotic. You can have a hypnotic state. And I think there is a little bit of suggestion like, did you feel euphoria? Yes, that means it's working. You don't need evidence at that point. You don't need proof. You just made a connection. The connection may not be real, but you have made it in your own head. And that's what, that's what Dianetics does. And that's, that's why it works because of that connection. Now, it could be also that just talking about traumas, you know, if you keep something inside of yourself for many, many months or years, and you just sit down with someone and talk about your feelings, and you're allowed to express your feelings, and you're allowed to be angry when you should be, and happy when you should be, it can also create a euphoric sense, because you're getting things off your chest. So the magic behind Dianetics, the closing your eyes, the counting to 10, the going through these engrams, the reactive mind, it's all a smokescreen. It's all a facade. What you really are doing is you're sitting down with someone who's got trauma, and they're simply talking about issues that they have kept to themselves, in my case especially, for many months and many years. 
Uh, things that even, again, come from your childhood, of course. You have childhood traumas. Most people do. There's an accident or somebody did something to you. You witnessed something. That's the magic. The magic is simple talk therapy. It's not the smokescreen of anything that you learn in Dianetics or anything right. at all. You know, it's not the, again, it's not those steps that you learn. It's just you and someone talking. You know, right. that's, that's the euphoria. <laughs> I was discussing, someone was asking me about the Dianetics process uh, the other day, and, and in trying to answer this question, the person said, it sounds like a form of trauma therapy. And mm -hmm. it would be easy for me to say yes, but the truth is, I don't know what trauma therapy consists of, so I can't mm -hmm. say yes or no. Do you have any idea what the similarity is? I know in trauma therapy, you are supposed to go through and relive those experiences, and you're supposed to sort of, I guess, bring yourself to come to a place where you can accept it. So there might be a little bit of overlap, but then again, trauma therapy is works and it's got good science behind it. And it's not, has nothing to do with the two, the two minds. Right. So it could be similar to a certain degree, but it's certainly not the same. Sure. Now, certainly from um, yeah. uh, to play the devil's advocate on the Scientologist side of things, mm -hmm. like a moment ago, you said, uh, did you feel a feeling of euphoria? That's Scientology working. And after that point, they would say, I don't need any evidence. But they would also argue that is the evidence that yeah. I felt better. I felt better. So it works. And in a sense, especially when you think about things like a placebo effect, in a sense, it seems weird to insist on that person. No, it didn't work. Because they're the ones sitting there going, but I felt better. How can you tell me it didn't work? And that's one of these things where I go, I think if Scientology and Dianetics only marketed itself as, hey, we can help you feel better about some things. Mm -hmm. And it didn't have the religion angle and it didn't have the tax exemption angle and it didn't have the, we destroy families for a living on the side. Like <laughs> if it was just Dianetics and you could just read the book and you could just do it and it just made people feel euphoric. I'm not sure that would be particularly objectionable to society at large. I, I mean, I never enjoyed Dianetics auditing personally, but when you okay. describe it that way, I'm not even sure people would have a problem with it. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I think the people that would have the problem though would be like the APA and stuff like that and the, and you know, the DEA and so forth, just because, but then again, you know, there's a lot of stuff in self-help that is not necessarily um, provable in a sense. There is an idea of subjectiveness, like you could pick up, you know, how to, how to win friends and influence people and follow everything and it might work, it might not work, right? It's self-help. So I think with self-help, there is a subjectiveness that's in there. But I, I do agree with you ultimately that if it wasn't the religion angle and it wasn't the, the disconnection, who cares? You pick up Dianetics, you try it, it might work, it might not work. It's completely subjective. It might cost a little bit of money. What's the price of a book? 10, 15, 20 dollars. And you're not investing millions. You're not going to the OTs. You're not putting your life on hold for OT7. You know, you're not uh, buying books one year and then buying the whole other books another year. Um, you know, the basics kind of stuff like the, the fraud stuff is not involved. On that, I agree with you. I mean, I really do. And, you know, even though there might not be, quote unquote, much hard evidence, um, let's even say that it's not necessarily healthy or unhealthy. It's just, does it work for you? Does it not work for you? Then I agree with you there. Um, I just think the establishment would, would probably give some arguments about why it just doesn't work and why it might be a pseudoscience, but would well, that even certainly matter, if it right? was being, certainly if it was being pushed as yeah. an alternative to real, um, right. to, well, mm -hmm. I want to say real medicine, but, but, you know, if people were encouraged to, um, you, you know, the whole, uh, don't go get chemotherapy, just get Dianetics auditing and you're yeah. killing people by doing that. You know what I mean? Right, right. There's something else you said that um, makes the Scientology discussion so unique in that the experience of, the Scientology experience of someone who never does the OT levels mm -hmm. is almost 100% different from the Scientology experience of those who do. Because mm -hmm. like I, like you, I'm someone who never did the OT levels, right? Yeah. And it's easy for you and I to go, you know, the Xenu and the body things and everything, that's not really day to day Scientology because for us it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But if we had done the OT levels and we had known 
that what it means to do the bridge in Scientology, what it means to go free, these words that Scientologists use, go OT, go free, to us, Scientology would become what Scientology is at the top of the bridge, <laughs> which is, well, we could say Xenu, but what it really means is what the Xenu story means, what, what L. Ron Hubbard says the Xenu story means for everyone on earth. <laughs> and doing Scientology and going up the bridge does in fact become resolving what happened in the Xenu story. Yeah. And so when I hear someone, Grant Cardone, for example, in interviews, <laughs> when someone tries to ask him about Xenu and the body paintings and trillions of years ago, he goes, hey, 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 I'm not worried about trillions of years ago. I'm worried about yesterday and today and paying my bills and taking care of my family. And I go, yeah, but the truth is, Scientologists who are OT, they are worried about trillions of years ago and mm -hmm. Xenu. And the reason they want you to get into Scientology is so that you can address what happened billions of years ago and trillions of years ago and the, and the Xenu story. Like, uh, it, I hope this is making sense in that mm -hmm. it's, it's, un, uh, it's unlike, like if we compare this to Christianity, the major religions of the world, if you were to capture what is the essence of them, their essence of them is the most important part of, of them. So Mm -hmm. God and Jesus and salvation is the most important part of, of Christianity. And so if you look at Scientology the same way, the Xenu story is the most important part, uh, is the essence of Scientology. But Scientology is one of the only groups who will pretend, no, no, don't, don't think about that. It's about, <laughs> it's about communication. It's about family relationships. It's about uh, getting work done better. You're like, wait a second. Why do you keep minimizing what Scientology is supposed to be? And it's because, mm -hmm. well, because if you tell them what it's really supposed to be, nobody would fucking walk in the door. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody would. And when people find out, they leave too, right? Because they can find out on Google, you know. <laughs> you can yeah, Google yeah. Zeno. You can find uh, Aaron Hubbard's writings and his handwriting. And then most people just say, you believe in this crap and they don't, they don't come back. I mean, I was a staff member for a year. And plenty of people don't come back after their first opportunity to come to a church. So, but yeah, yeah. the minimiza minimization, I think, is just maybe for ridicule and satire purposes, it makes it easier, which I guess is in some cases okay. I don't know. Like, it's really bizarre. Do you mean, do you mean minimizing know. it down to Xenu or minimizing it down to communication? Uh, Zenu, the Zenu stuff is easier. I mean, I love South Park and the South Park episode, you know, besides one or two things that were not accurate, like registering to become an OT7, it was pretty brilliant, you know, and there's been tons of, of different, I mean, we can talk about all the different documentaries and stuff, satirical stuff, the Louis Thoreau one, I, I also love. But, you know, I guess it's because once it came down to the public, it is a bit easier to sat satirize and it's a little bit easier to make fun of. And of course, religious sat satire, with Monty Python and all these just wonderful comedians do kind of reduce these complex things down to something very small and to ridicule it. But why, like why Scientologists don't acknowledge it is, I, I come to the same conclusion. It's because if people knew they would leave. I mean, that, that to yeah. me is the Occam's razor. It's the simplest explanation is the correct one. It's not because Scientology somehow works, but they're trying to keep a part of it hidden because people that aren't ready, it's not about that. It's about the fact that if people knew that that was the story, that that's where you were going to and you have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get to that level, you would leave. That, that's yeah. why it is. To me, there's no other answer. There's no other pragmatic answer than it just sounds really ridiculous. They can't reconcile the fact that it sounds ridiculous. When you accept that you have to have that number of training to get there, to put it in your head that that's real, and then they can tell you. But yeah. that, that's it. It's just, it's, it's a facade. Really. Yeah. So I don't want to skip over any important parts of your sure. story. And so if my next question does that, we'll come back to it. But mm -hmm. how did you go from being a Scientologist in Toronto, Canada, mm -hmm. to being on staff in Berlin, Germany? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, so when I started again in May of 2005 at the end, beginning of June 2005, I started my first courses in Toronto. And then in September of 2005, I moved to Europe for the first time. And I spent time in Poland, uh, 2005, 2006. And I was actually teaching English 
um, at a school. And I was in the western part of Poland, which was only about a 90 minute train ride to Berlin. So when I was doing my Dianex seminar, and which I think I actually might have finished in Toronto, I did finish in Toronto that summer. So I started the Hubbard Dynex Auditor course. And I was, because it was the closest org, I went to Berlin three or four times in maybe a six to nine month period to do the course, to do the Dynex Auditor course. Now this was the Berlin org, this was the pre-ideal org. So this particular org was quite small. It was in an area called Mariendorf Adam, which is in the South. It used to be part of the American side of Berlin. And I took my 90 minute train ride a couple times to Berlin and then uh, 20 minutes on the subway um, metro to this particular place, went to the org, did twinning and um, ended up being making friends with a couple staff members, one of which um, we kept in touch. And so after I left my position in Poland, which was in the summer of 2006, my, uh, I kept doing courses in Toronto. And in December of 2006, my mom and I went to Los Angeles and we were actually there live for the New Year's Eve event at the Shrine Auditorium. And that is when David Miscavige had announced that Berlin had the ideal org. Before that time, Stuttgart was supposed to get the ideal org. And I actually did, uh, did an interview with Tony Ortega a long time ago about what had happened, why Stuttgart was not the ideal org, why Berlin was the ideal org. Anyway, unbeknownst to me, I, the Berlin gets the ideal org. I'm sitting in Los Angeles in the Trine Auditorium. David Miscavige is talking about Berlin. I see the people, like I see the people that I know um, <laughs> from the screen. And shortly after, I can't remember if I made contact or they made contact with me. Um, in like January of 2007, but between January 2007 and May 2008, I was on a recruitment, um, you know, uh, cycle, and it ended up being that um, I left in May, like second week of May 2007, and joined staff there because of the connections that I had made that, you know, previous year uh, and previous year and a half. Um, who was doing I, did I maybe I missed it if you said sure. it. who was doing the recruitment with you I'm sorry uh, her name was Helena Stender she was a, a staff she staff member and was a staff member in Berlin so that's what that was who I was emailing with I apologize but she I guess at the time she was just some executive in Berlin and I had known her previously in 2006 and 2005 and then got in communication with her again in late 2006 early 2007 and we we put that uh, cycle together to for me to go on staff did you speak german i was learning german uh when i was in in poland and then i was like still a beginner but it was it was a struggle uh it was a struggle to to go to the org which was german speaking and to to, <laughs> to try to communicate, <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, but I, I didn't speak a, a lot of it. And um, by the end of it, I spoke more, but um, not enough. <laughs> but the fact that you didn't speak the language uh, didn't keep them from wanting you as a staff member. The fact that I didn't have a visa didn't keep them from wanting me as a staff member. So German was, not knowing German was easy. They, oh, you'll learn. People will just talk to you in German. And you'll just have to figure it out, which is what people did. <laughs> so, was there no Scientology? Was there no Scientology organ hungry? Yeah, that there was in Budapest, and um, there's there, they have an ideal org here, um, but there was in Budapest, and I actually did visit there a, a couple times in 2005 and six as well. Um, but weird, weird enough, oddly enough, when I was asking, like, hey, I you know maybe I could join staff here. For some reason, they weren't as aggressive as in Berlin. I don't know why. I, maybe it's just the Hungarian culture. But like they were like, yeah, I guess you could sign a staff contract if you want. But, you know, it was like really relaxed. Whereas Berlin was like, you got to sign. You know, we were, we, we've got to get you a date. You've got to go through your checklist. It was really, really quite different. Um, so I could have gone to, Ber uh, to Budapest, but uh, ended up in Berlin instead. <laughs> That's interesting. I, I, 
when I asked the question, I thought yeah. that somehow you'd actually been recruited while in Canada to go to Berlin, but that's not even how that went down. So, what, I mean, I was living in Canada at the time, but again, because I had known, I had known these people from when I lived in Poland, that that's the connection that was made. So again, I can't, and I cannot remember if I emailed Helena or if she emailed me, it was one of the two where I had seen the new org and obviously they were recruiting and I just don't remember who, who, who emailed who first, but that's where the connection was made in like January of 2007, somewhere around there. So, and I really want to remember who, who, who did what, but I just, I, I've forgotten, that's okay. but that, that's when the cycle started. Yeah. Was there anything remarkable about your time in Scientology in Canada between uh, 2005, 2007? Mm. I did a, a bunch of courses, you know, I did my uh, HDS, HDA, and then I ended up doing success through communication, overcoming ups and downs, a couple extension courses, the org itself in Toronto, and I don't even know if it's there anymore. It was this really large building around uh, Young Street and Bloor, which is like a very busy sort of midtown area in Toronto. And the building was awful. I mean, it was a large building, but it was just dilapidated, very old. Elevators didn't work. Um, it was run down. And I think they've moved offices. There's also an ideal org in a place called Cambridge, Ontario, which is near uh, an area called Kitchener, sort of southwestern Ontario. Um, very bizarre. Like, I, just, I don't even know where the Toronto org is today. I have no clue. It could be in some office somewhere. But that was really the thing. The people I, I never really liked, um, <laughs> they were very aggressive. I always remember being regged for a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you know, it, I never liked studying. I did like the auditing, but I never really liked going and being in the, in the course room because the course supervisor in Toronto was not nice at all. Um, but remarkable, probably not, you know, nothing, nothing, too, nothing too big. I was just a public. So maybe was other that, than aggressive recruiting, was that, but <laughs> was that building the one that had the CLO on top of it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, you Mark had Hedley, members Mark coming Hedley's, and going. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Mark Headley's sister uh, was uh, stationed there as well during the time that I was there. Um, but yeah, there was exactly on top of CLO, I guess, Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so there were always, always CERG members and a lot of American Sea Org members. I remember talking to Sea Org members from South Africa, um, United States. But yeah, the top two or three floors were, were CLO, and then everything else was the org. Was Crystal Hollinen still on staff when you were there? Does that ring a bell? Or Jennifer Davies yeah. or Bill Butcher? Ooh, Crystal rings a bell. Do you remember a guy named Bill Ostbath? He was there. Um, and then there were the, the, gosh, what was their last name? Fensky? There was a couple, anyway, yeah, um, Crystal, Crystal, I, th I think if, I think I know who that is. The other two I'm not sure of, but um, yeah, there's a small, small, small group there. I think what, maybe, maybe 50 if they were lucky, you know, um, but uh, very rundown org again, not very impressive, but um, Bill Oskvath, Crystal and Fensky, a couple of them named Fensky was, was the people that I, was more in contact with so yeah okay so by the time you make it to berlin mm -hmm. had they already done their grand opening for the ideal org that's right that was done that was done i think they did a something in december for the for the new year's eve event and then i believe it was january of 2007 that they had their grand opening um and that they i mean they had pictures of that all over the org they had videos about that all over the org so even though i wasn't there I've seen, I've seen it. I, I, I knew what went on. I knew the, the daily, you know, activities, <laughs> what was going on there that day. So what was that all like? What was some of the most remarkable things about that experience for you? Oh man, <laughs> it was a lot. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, like when you talk to Sabrina, um, we did the full, full time schedule and the full, full time schedule was an absolute nightmare. Um, that's working, being on post at the morning muster from 9 a.m. and not leaving till 11 and basically having 
a couple of 15 minute breaks and a 45 minute break for lunch. I mean, it was brutal. I was exhausted just all the time, just so tired. Um, and I mean, that, that, that was the toughest thing to, to, to do. And when I got to Berlin, I had no idea that they had only one org. I thought like Toronto, they had day foundation, just like most other organizations. I didn't even think to ask that question because it had never been a part of any reality. You know, LA org had to, um, all these other orgs that I had known, Budapest had day and foundation. So I get there and they're like, you know, this is the schedule. You have these units, they call them time units for a day. There's 28, you get two off. So you get to select which two. And other than that, you're in the org. And if you don't want to be on a full full time schedule, you basically have to get permission um, and have some excuse or some reason why you want your hours reduced. The other thing was I wasn't I didn't have any income. So my staff pay was my income. And of course, it was not enough to pay my rent. It was not enough to pay my food. But being on full full time meant that whatever units I had, and I was an expediter, so you have four staff units, four staff pay units, I would be getting eight, eight staff pay units. So whatever I was going to make would be doubled. And I was told that even if in the first couple months I was only getting, you know, 20 euros, 30 euros, 40 euros, that we were going St. Hill size in the summer. And then when we were going St. Hill size in the summer, I'd be making between 800 and 1,000 euros a month, which would be more than enough for me to pay for food and my apartment. Of course, it was a pyramid scheme um, that did not happen. Months and months went by where St. Hill size, we were almost there and then we weren't there and then we we're almost there again and then we weren't there again. And by the time I left, and I also know from Sabrina, that they never went St. Hill size. They may have been close, maybe, but even then, um, it was a pyramid scheme. But even talking about St. Hill, even them talking about St. Hill size as being some sort of a target where once you attain it, things change. Yeah. St. Hill size is just a size. Like, <laughs> even if you're getting close to St. Hill size, that's still pretty goddamn good like you should it's not like, like uh, they're, they're pitching it almost as if once you cross this line everything changes and you're like that's yeah. not how things work <laughs> i read the i read the policies i mean we had in the back of us I, I eventually went on to treasury i started in uh, the dynex foundation as a letter writer then i went on to treasury i looked at the ideal packet that they had of policies i looked at l ron hubbard st hill size policy and what an ideal org policy i mean this is policy straight from the from the volumes and yeah it's just like it just has a bunch of staff and whatever like yes there's a certain number of auditors a certain number of bodies in the shop a certain number a certain number and it was like we weren't even close to that but we were doing okay when i was there at the beginning the first few months and then it started to teeter down and go really, really right. downhill after the summer. And so this whole St. Hill size thing, that, that, that's what it was. The other thing, um, uh, if you recall, when an org gets St. Hill size, they're supposed to get what's called the universe core, which is a group of Scientologists, maybe five Scientologists that are OTs that are supposed to come in and train the staff to become up to OT5. In the Berlin org, they had their own auditing room and they had their own course room. So every time you go to the, to the sixth floor and walk by the universe core, that was supposed to be the target. That was when supposed to be, everything was supposed to change. We were all supposed to get good money. We all could afford, you know, afford good food and whatever. And then we would get this staff training on, you know, up to OT. We were all going to become OT fives if we got St. Health size. So a lot of, again, a lot of uh, multi-level marketing stuff and period stuff yeah. going on. Well, again, I guess, for the benefit of those watching, it's like, you know, St. Hill size is supposed to be roughly, and these could be wrong, don't quote me, but we're talking ballpark sure, figures. Sure. The org's making $100,000 a week in gross income. You've got 150 to 200 staff. You're doing mm -hmm. maybe 100 to 200 hours of um, uh, professional auditing a week and things like this. So it's almost like for them to, for, for the executives to talk to new staff members and be like, hey, don't worry, once we go St. Hill size, everything's gonna be great. You'd go like, well, wait, are we approaching it? Like, are we are we getting any closer? Because it doesn't matter if you cross the line. It matters if you're making enough money to pay the fucking staff. <laughs> yeah. And there was not enough. <laughs> at all. 
let me let me say another thing here about because what you mentioned about the unit uh, system you know mm -hmm. for those watching orgs are paid on a unit system so you have your gross income then you take a bunch of expenses off the top you end up with your adjusted gross income yeah. and then like 30 percent of the adjusted gross income is allocated for staff pay and each staff member is awarded a certain unit value so you take the entire staff pay sum you divide it up amongst all the staff units to get a unit value and then if you're a staff member and you're you know you you are basically your worth is four and a half units that's what you're getting paid so your pay each week depends on directly depends on how much money was made each week but here's where i'm going mm -hmm. with this mark for them to say hey you're you're a four unit staff member uh but since you work both shifts you're going to get eight units but mm -hmm. if everyone works both shifts eight units and four units is the exact same thing <laughs> it's the same thing it's exactly yeah the biggest scam is the is this full full-time schedule i mean not only is the other orgs a scam the st hill size is a scam this working for <laughs> it's one of the many scams it was yeah. it was ludicrous ludicrous and that didn't count being a man we had to, i had to do night watch so sometimes i was up for 30 to 35 hours because i had to do two shifts night watch and then go to another shift. So I didn't go to sleep for God knows how long. Um, well, they wouldn't let a woman. They wouldn't let a woman do the night shift there. No, 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 no females on night watch. That's sexy. no women on night watch. Yeah, and the night watch would start at ten o'clock, and you were supposed to be relieved at nine. And of course, nobody likes to go on reception, so that means you could be relieved at twelve or one. And then if you're, you're supposed to be on post at one you go on post and then you're there till 11 so that was constantly being up for whatever plus there were certain projects you know we had the sea org there we had um angie blankenship was there um was she really yeah do you know do you know and you know walter kotrick her uh, his um his wife i forget she's a kotrick as well and hans smith they they were the missionaries one two and three they were there they were kicking ass they were getting people all the executives to stay God knows how long, just hours and hours and hours to do these freaking projects. Um, missionary first, second, and third. And we, had, we didn't know their names, but we had to salute them. Um, and like just these projects that were on were just like, they were just so incompetent, you know, getting certain amount of things done and that were just anyway. And, you know, there are all, tons of all-nighters. But, you know, the first couple of months, the staff was so pumped up with this idea that they were going to get St. Hill size and that things were going to be okay, that everyone was dedicated. And then again, by the time the summer ended in 2007, it was like everyone just hit the wall at the same time and we're just completely burnt out. Um, but, you know, again, you don't get paid for overtime. So yeah. you don't get paid. You also don't get paid when I was going, um, um, Sabrina mentioned the book stands. You could go out in the book stands for 110 hours in a week. And because you're doing no production in the org, you might get paid next to nothing because you've been out selling books. And if you sell a book, you might get a little commission, but like me, you know, I don't speak German. So I have to go out. I had to go out during Christmas. I think I spent about 110, 115 hours one week at the book stand. And I came back and got my staff pay and it was like 11 euros because I hadn't done anything in New York. So 11 euros, you put that to a calculator. It's like eight cents an hour. You know, it's just things that just don't, they don't make sense at all. Like I'm supposed to be doing my job. I'm supposed to be working for the org, but then there's all these other things that are distractions that you can be pulled away at any time to do that have nothing to do with you or what you're supposed to be doing in the org. And it's just very, very, very scammy, you know, yeah. <laughs> very, very not good. No, I mean, you hear a lot about uh, how the Sea Org uh, works for slave wages, but what a lot of people don't understand is that Scientology's non C org staff make uh, an equally small amount of money, except these people actually have to support themselves in the real world. Oh, whereas yeah. C org members don't have any bills other than deodorant and soap or whatever. Like C org members don't have bills. You can make no money for six months on end and you can eat and you can have a roof over your head and your laundry will get done. Not if you're a Scientology staff member. So, Mark, you're working 98 hours a week on a good week, 110 mm -hmm. hours a week on a bad week. Uh, what's a typical week of pay for you? Was 11 euros typical or was it more than that? 11 euros was the bottom. 86 was the top. So average somewhere between maybe 30 and 50. 
Um, and that again, really has to depend. And, and I know I've, forgive, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but there really was after September of 2007 and before. So there was sort of before my halfway and after my halfway. Before the halfway, for the first three, four months, pay was pretty okay. We're anywhere between 40, 50, 60 euros a week. So it was at least enough to eat. I could put a little bit of wave and savings to pay for my apartment. Then once the fall came and once the early winter came, especially in early 2008, it was anywhere from 10, 11 euros a week to 30. And it just depend. it depended on, on the week, as you mentioned, because some sometimes that 86 euros, I remember it happened twice, happened around Christmas because you do get a Christmas bonus. So in total, that was 86 euros. And then I think in like June, around June, someone came into the org and dropped like for a 12, 12, uh, 12 and a half hour intensives. So that was like whatever, 100,000 euros or something. So when somebody does something big like that, the staff get pay, gets paid pretty good. But when you're when you're doing nothing, when you're on the book stand or when you have a couple of bodies in the shop and you sell maybe a couple of you know introductory courses, then it gets down to maybe 10, 15 euros. Um, so I would say, yeah, av average was was maybe if I was lucky, I could say I could spend two to three or four euros a day on food. That, and that's how much I had. So my apartment ended up being where, because I had Sea Org members live with me, the staff ended up paying for the majority of my rent for at least the last four or five months. So that was okay in that sense that I contributed like a hundred euros, my roommate contributed a hundred euros, and then the rest was contributed by the org. And I was taking that out from savings. Um, but it was the food. It was like, I have two euros today. What can I eat? And that's where a lot of problems uh, started to happen with not just me, but with, uh, with the entire staff, especially the full full-time staff members. I think people who watch and listen to this stuff are just, the, or I put myself in their shoes and I go, yeah. this is an organization that is well known to have billions of dollars. Oh yeah. And their fucking staff members can't mm -hmm. afford to eat. It's so, and this is, this is religious freedom for you folks. This is religious protection under the law. This is what it gets to you. At you least know, Scientology style. When I left Scientology, Jeffrey Augustine was one of the first critics I, I spoke to. And he basically said, the church has enough money to pay for every member's bridge three times over and to provide a life for everybody. They're just hawking and hoarding money to pay for lawsuits. The IAS alone, you know, not just the RTC, just the IAS alone has enough money to give us all an apartment, maybe a three bedroom apartment. You put a couple people in there to become a staff member or whatever. Like it doesn't just have to be the Sea Org, even staff, because there really aren't a lot of us who are staff members. If the church wanted to do that, they could do it, but they're not for a reason and the reason turns out to be again the simplest reason is probably the correct one because it's not about making it's not about making people better it's about one person hoarding money <laughs> and wearing two thousand two thousand dollar suits and having hundred thousand dollar motorcycles and getting pimped out with limousines and of course that's cob um and you know hobnobbing with celebrities it's not it's not even about the people on the bottom of the barrel who are simply trying to get people into the church. It's not about that. It's just about hawking cash. So it's true. But, it's yeah. true. Which is, which is, um, it's such a fucking dichotomy. It's such a, Scientology is such a study in contradictions and maybe it's not, <laughs> maybe it just seems unique to me because it's the only, it's the only one of its kind I'm familiar with. You know, I don't have any knowledge of the bureaucracy of the Roman Catholic Church. You know, maybe <laughs> maybe those guys have similar stories. <laughs> but what but the contradiction for me is that you have an organization that is so clearly not motivated by genuinely wanting to help people or even get people up their own so-called bridge to total freedom. And no. yet for the <laughs> staff members, for the staff members, it's the opposite. The reason staff members put up with this kind of abuse is because they do believe in the mission. They are there to help. They do think doing Scientology is valuable. 
And this is what I mean when I say a study in contradiction. The organization itself at the, at the highest levels clearly does not feel the same way. And it's just, it's, it's wild just to consider. And even the pr prices, you know, how much is a 12 hour intensive just to go clear, to get through your grades? You, you did make a video on this. I uh, used to get mail from Flag and they used to give me the price lists. I mean, it's all advertised. They say, they say request a donation, bullshit, you gotta pay. <laughs> and then that doesn't include your e-meters, your course packs. Like I remember going to get a course and they're like, well, now you have to pay for the course pack. The course fee is different from the course pack. What? When, what? If I pay for a course, don't I get everything? Oh no, there's more. And then may, might have to buy a book and on and on. It's like, it's like um, the worst cable company in the world. You paid for two channels, but if you want the good channels, you got to pay more. It's like, what the hell's going on here? Didn't I pay for a package? No, there's more and there's more and there's more. Um, and it really is just about making money uh, at the top. As you say, at the yeah. bottom, at the very bottom, all the staff members that I knew had very good intentions. Some of those end results were probably not good because there's a lot of corruption. Talked about violence with Sabrina. There's a lot of bad end results and a lot of bad apples, of course. And it's, it's sad. I went through a lot of that myself. But the intentions are good. People really do want to bring people into Scientology because they are convinced that it works. And they're convinced that it has done good things for them. So it can do good things for other people. But practically speaking, it is so difficult to bring people in, to keep them to stay, and for them to actually go on course and move up the bridge that I wonder, and I always used to wonder, is it is really at the top? Is it about bringing in new members? And I have to say, it's not. I think it's really all those barriers that they put into people with money. If you've had too many surgeries, too many illnesses, if you've got a heart condition, if you're impoverished, there's just so many things that they stick right, you know, right in front of your face that prevent you from going up the bridge. And I wonder, because to me, it just makes sense that they have a bunch of cash cows. They have a couple thousand millionaires and billionaires that they're living off of. And those people can go up the bridge. You can't. They're very elitist in a way that I have never, I mean, maybe, maybe there are other religions, spiritual groups and so forth that are like this, but nothing that I would have ever experienced in the dozen or so religious groups that I explored before and after Scientology. If you want to go to a certain, if you want to go to a Roman Catholic church, you can go. If you don't have food, they can give you food. Like there's these social justice initiatives that churches do, doesn't exist in Scientology. There's no such thing as a free Scientology center. Despite what it says in the book, what is Scientology? If you ask for free services, you're looked down upon. It's just, it's absolutely atrocious. And I, and I do believe it's to prevent people like me, certain people like me from getting in and from keeping the people that are in, in. And that's the only thing to me that makes sense. Let, let me paint a different picture there. Sure. So the same pressure that you and the other staff members in Berlin were under every single day to get your stats up, uh, Sea Org members at the advanced orgs are under that exact same pressure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the Sea Org members who are responsible for getting people onto OT1, onto OT3, mm -hmm. 5, 7, those guys are under the exact same pressures and experience the exact same penalties for not getting yeah. their stats up, even though their stats are completely dependent upon how many Scientologists are getting into Scientology at the lower levels, because only oh. those people can move up to the higher level, right? Right. Those people have even less control over their day-to-day -day statistics than people at the Berlin Org, but they're under the same pressure. So okay. here's, where mm -hmm. I'm, here's where I'm going with this. When management, which really just means David Miscavige, mm -hmm. when he comes out with some new edict that puts further restrictions on who's allowed onto the OT levels, those staff members at the advanced orgs are sitting there going, oh, son of a bitch. Now we're never going to get our stats up, right? So mm -hmm. even at the highest levels, the worker Scientologists want as many people going up the bridge as possible. It seems like David Miscavige is uniquely opposed to people going up the bridge. <laughs> yeah. And it's weird. He's the only one. He's the only one whose stats don't depend on it. His stats are Sea Org reserves. 
and his stats are sealed <laughs> reserves. There is a statistic of basically value of advanced wow. sci- uh, services delivered, value of advanced tech VSD. <laughs> But Miscavige has changed his stat so that as long as Scientology keeps buying more property and as oh, long as his assets keep growing, he can still pay himself his cash bonuses. Did you know that? I'm sure he's doing. I did not know that, of course, but it makes sense. <laughs> and I don't mean to give him too much of a benefit of the doubt here, but I would have to, want, I believe, and I'm pulling this out of my ass, this is my opinion. Mm. I believe that his drive to restrict how many people go up the bridge has something to do with trying to minimize lawsuits or minimize, Mm. like, I don't know that he's sitting there like pathologically not wanting people to get auditing when, why does he give a shit if people get auditing? Uh, He he wants people to pay as much money as anyone else does. Yeah. He doesn't, right? I I don't know. I'd have to think about it a little more, but it does, but I guess I wanted, the only thing I wanted to stress here Mm -hmm. is that there's no layer of Scientology management um, until you get to David Miscavige, who's been given permission to not get their stats up and not get people to buy auditing and not get no. people to take auditing. Everybody is still expected to do that or else. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if that's really different than what you're saying. Is it? Is, it, is that a different perspective than what you were, where you were going? Well, again, I was never in the Sea Org, so some of those perspectives I'm, I'm more limited on my own. Um, but I do understand what you're saying because as far as it looked like to me, once somebody was interested, once you sold them that this was a one size fits all, then it became extremely difficult because you have to be, you have to change your whole life. You have to change your whole perspective. It's not a it's not a religion where you can be part of any different religion. It's not like that, right? You know, you can't be a Christian and a Scientologist or whatever. So, I think that a lot of those restrictions um, give them also a sort of um, narcissistic kind of thing, like, well, only a few people can be Scientologists. You know, what do they say? The Sea Org is the upper 10% of the upper 10% of society. Um, and that, that just means you're 1% of society, which the Sea Org is or, not even 1% or whatever. Like the know. upper 10% well, of the upper 10%. Yeah, okay, yes, <laughs> that's the one. And it's like, how many people are that, you know? Um, So there is an elitist thing. And so so for someone like myself, one of the reasons I discontinued Scientology was previously I I had had surgeries, um, a bunch of surgeries as a kid because I was sick a lot. So of course you get all these engrams. So that's that would prevent me to go up the bridge. I had a couple of health issues. I couldn't get on the PRF. So there's another thing. Like there were all these things in my way that eventually I just threw my hands and I said, like, I don't want to do these. And I never really liked the intro services except for a couple of them. I never liked being, I also never liked study tech. So I thought, what's my future in Scientology? Doing things that I don't like with courses that don't get me up the bridge. And just because I have a couple of health issues, you know what I mean? Like it just, it, to me, it was like, okay, this is a barrier and I can't do what I want. Every Scientologist wants to go OT. If I can't go OT, there's no point staying in the introductory services for the next 50 years. And why couldn't you go OT? Well, I ended up, uh, again, I ended up having, um, uh, I have health issues, and so I couldn't go to the Purus. So the pur- the purification rundown, of course, is, I-, I never did it, Aaron, I guess you probably did it, right, the Purus? Um, I did it. So because I have a, a, a heart issue, I was not medically cleared because it is a big stress on your heart. My, even my doctor, who wasn't a Scientologist, when I explained this to her, she said, you're not going to do this you could go into cardiac arrest. Now my heart condition is mild, very thankfully, but it can be exacerbated. And so the fact that I was not medically cleared to just go on the PRF, that means that's, that's literally the first step on the bridge for many people. That means no training, no auditing up to your class fives or beyond, and there's no grades. So I would have literally just been stuck doing introductory services for the rest of my time in Scientology. So you um, never had any auditing behind, beyond book one Dianetics no. and introductory Scientology audit? That's right. Never, nothing uh-huh. beyond book one. Nothing beyond book one. And I did a whole number of courses, but I never, and I did do, eventually when you become a staff member, you go to the academy. So I did do staff that is zero, one, and two um, in the academy. And then I did, again, a whole bunch of other introductory services in in the public side but that was the thing you can't you can't get on the purif so i was like so what's my future <laughs> you know oh for again, sure 
like nothing. Can, I, you can't do anything. I have never heard of that before. Meaning I've heard of people not being medically cleared for the Purif. I've heard of people being declared an illegal, illegal pre-cleared due to past right. psychiatric care. I've never heard of someone getting into Scientology um, being a legal, a legal PC, yeah. but being totally blocked on the bridge because they couldn't do the Purif. I've never run into that. I've never heard of that. Well, one of the things uh, that happened to me was um, maybe we're going a little ahead, but I think it's interesting to say after nine months on staff in Berlin, I went to San Francisco, as I mentioned, and San Francisco had a guy who was a class, whatever, CS, five or whatever, Latch, his name was, the last Steve, name Latch, Steve, Steve Latch. Latch. I know yeah, Steve. And, I, li and um, I lived in Steve and his wife, Jennifer. Um, yeah. who was a very lovely uh, young woman. Um, I stayed, they had a house, they have a house in San Francisco and all the staff members were, were in there. So that's where I lived. Anyway. Um, Hold I, on. I, yeah. The San Francisco staff members all lived in a house owned sorry. by Steve Latch, the senior CS. Oh, sorry, some of us, some of us did. So um, I don't even know how to, because San Francisco is such a weird place. There were like, it was a house, but then there were also apartments. Like it's anyway, it was really weird. There were like four or five apartments in this house complex. I don't know how to even explain it. It was so bizarre. Um, and we, we, I lived there with two other staff members and then other staff members lived on top. So the whole like unit was owned by the latches. And then the only reason apartments. I interrupted you, I the only know, reason sorry. I interrupted yeah. to ask about this <laughs> is because it's such an interesting sorry. part of the staff story yeah. that while while staff members can barely afford to eat, yeah. someone like Steve Latch, who's been a staff member for yeah. 30 years, mm -hmm. is making money off of yes. other staff members yes. by renting. That's all. That's the only reason I yeah. interrupted you. I just wanted to make sure. No, no. Because Steve and Latch I, is the senior case supervisor. He's profiting yeah, yeah. off of the fact that all these Scientology staff members need a place to live. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, and you know, 100%. Yeah, I apologize. Anyway, and again, the building itself was so strange because it was a house, but then it had apartments. Very bizarre. Anyway, um, so when I was there, Steve saw my PC folder. Now, remember, I had been in Scientology for two years at this point. And I had been on staff for nine months. Steve decided that I was not qualified to be a staff member, even though I had been a staff member for nine months, even though my CF, my pre-clear folders had been already um, case supervised by the case supervisors in Toronto and Berlin. So I ended up getting a goldenrod to tell me that I was not qualified for a staff member. And the reason I got not qualified for a staff member was partly because of my medical issues, which again, I disclosed the first freaking day that I was a Scientologist. And also because I mentioned that I was a member of ARS for an hour back in when I was 15. And so they just booted me off staff. And I just, I, I, I went to LA in May, uh, shortly after to talk to somebody and I got a rigmarole and then I decided to leave after that. Very, very short story. But that's that was the reason. So I had been a staff member for nine months, but I was not qualified to be on staff. Amazing. I know Steve <laughs> very, very well. I know yeah. his wife, Jennifer, very, very well. Yeah. She was a staff member at the Chicago org. Left yeah, she was staff yep. there, went to San Francisco. That's you right. know, it's funny. I was doing a little research for another video I'm going to do. And I ended up watching a video that Jennifer Latch recorded on the Scientology website. Okay. Um, giving fake success stories. Right. Yeah. You and I know Jennifer Latch was born and raised in Scientology. Mm -hmm. She attested to clear when she was still in her teens. And here she is on this video going, when I had my first baby, I was all depressed and I could barely even operate. So I had some Dianetics auditing and it fixed everything. I'm like, <laughs> bitch, you didn't have Dianetics auditing. You haven't had Dianetics auditing since you were 18 years old. Yeah. Um, and also so she's a professional actor as well. She's a professional yeah. actor. So it's like, yeah, like <laughs> her job is to to say lines that she didn't write. But yeah, I get it. I get it. 
I liked so, her. Though. Me... I like Jennifer. I hated Steve, but I, I thought Jennifer was really nice. Anyway, <laughs> Steve was with this. Steve was this Scientology trust fund trust fund baby yeah. who I think his parents gifted him OT three when he turned yep. sixteen or something. Uh, Steve's uh, uh, his parents were rich. They've been you know uh, oh, San yeah. Francisco hippies since um, whenever that was a thing. Um, and they're Lloyd still, they're the still father. Rich. Lloyd was the father. Lloyd Latch, and I remember. Uh, I had a conversation my first day on post with Lloyd. Lloyd was a foundation staff member and I had come from Berlin and we had a, about a 10 minute conversation just about Berlin and whatnot. And he was telling me, he, I think he got in, Lloyd Latch was like one of the first Dionysists, um, at least uh, if not the first one of the first Scientologists. So he's like a founding quote unquote member. Um, but I liked him and I said, as I like Jennifer, Steve, I did not like, I did not get along with him <laughs> at all. Um, but he wouldn't even remember me anyway, but, uh, just some anecdotes. <laughs> so, Hey, how did you end up leaving Berlin and going to San Francisco? What was that about? Well, Berlin, um, was basically a nightmare. Um, the first nightmare again, was not just the schedule. It was my visa issue. So I entered Germany on what was called a visa waiver, which most people can do for 90 days. During those 90 days, I knew that I had to get some kind of visa or resident permit. And so a couple of times a week, I approached the DSA. Uh, that was Zabina Weber. And Zabina Weber, um, I guess, put my case to another co-worker. Her name was Ingeborg Michalis. And Ingeborg Michalis literally was like scared of me or something like she just didn't want to do it. So I remember approaching her and she would just throw her hands up and, and run away from me. So I was like, like, what the hell's going on? So this went on week after week. And I guess it would have been like the middle of August when I would have been considered illegal in Germany. And of course, I didn't want that to happen. You know what I mean? Um, so I finally brought it to my roommate, who at the time, I forget his post, his name was Søren. I think he's in the Sea Org now, Søren Wagner. And he, uh, he got me in touch with a woman named Ava, Ava Muller, I think was her name. Anyway, we went down to the office and I got this residence permit. Now, there was a number of stipulations on this residence permit, which was unbeknownst to me. Because, of course, in the correspondence between me and Helena and me and Surin before I left for, for Berlin, so when I was in Canada, I could get an apartment, I would get a visa, like everything was just, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. whatever I asked could be done, right? Oh, it's all lies. So the day that I, the day that was 90 days, the exact day of 90 days that when I entered Berlin, I got this residence permit. So the residence permit stipulation was that I, and they knew I was in Scientology because um, Ava had been speaking to them. Because Scientology is not considered, not just not a religion, but not just, you know, considered even a business, like it's kind of got this weird status in Germany. Essentially, what I was doing for the church was considered on my own time. Any money I got was considered separate. So what I had to do is I had to get someone had to uh, pay for my stay. So of course I got my mom to write a note saying that she would you know, pay for my uh, room and board, I guess you could say, or pay for my rent and whatnot. And then I had to take German lessons. And if I wanted a job, I had to prove to the government that a German could not do the job. And the permit itself, I think was only around for like six months. So, not so I kept fighting this like I kept saying like maybe I should just go like maybe I should just leave staff like this is this that would be the easiest thing so uh, you know when when you do stuff status one you read about leaving and leaves you read about how to how to get onto the um leaving staff uh routing form I went to every single terminal that I could to just say like an HCO the chaplain to say like this is not going to work First of all, I can't get a visa for two and a half years. I can only get this residence permit for six months. I've already been here for three. It's not going to work. Every single terminal just said, no, like you're going to stay here. You are going to figure it out because that's what, that's what you do. You make things go right. So as the months kept going, 
I did have to sign up for German courses, which I only took for a couple of weeks um, because that, that you know bled into my work schedule which meant i had to take reduced course schedule any job that i went for because their scientologists had had jobs in the org i couldn't prove that a german person couldn't do it um, i applied for teaching positions but the teaching positions were full-time so at that point then i'd have to go off staff so then again every turn that i made to try to to actually try to make this thing go right came with a barrier till finally <laughs> someone uh someone that well you and sabrina spoke to the wife actually the, the the wife of someone that you and sabrina spoke to her name is sandy bole lucas bole's wife sandy she got in on this for whatever reason and the last three or four months i it was basically almost every day i would be sitting in her office trying some way to to stay past those six months and she suggested everything from me working and going to school and going to the org she made a schedule one week Aaron where literally the schedule was that I would be getting up at like seven and going to bed at 4 a.m I would go from the org to the to the classes to a job or classes job and I would look at her and I say you know there's like three hours a night I'm sleeping here and she she just looked at me and she said so what she said well it's like a Sea Org member why can't you do this I said three hours a night like no I can't sleep for three hours a night go from the org to my classes to another job like this is not it's not humanly possible for anyone to do this and she said well it's your job to make it go right she suggested that I stayed longer. She suggested stuff that was completely illegal, like for me staying longer past my visa. She tried to get me to marry a German. Like the, the stuff that they were pulling out of their asses was absolutely ridiculous, okay? Just so I could stay. Finally, and this was something that was really, really great. When I booked my ticket to Berlin, I had to book a return ticket. So I booked my return ticket on February 11th of 2008. Now that ticket could have been brought up. It could have been brought back. I could have done anything with that ticket and I would have had to pay a fee, but I still kept that return ticket. And finally, I just, I just got them to admit Sabrina Weber and Sandy Bole that there was nothing that could be done and that I'm going to fly on February 11th. So the last meeting that I had in the director's special affairs office with Zabina and with Sandy, they had put me through three, four months of hell, suggesting things that wouldn't work, trying to get, I was put on ethics because of course it was my fault, right? They had tried to get me to admit it was my fault, admit that I was, you know, doing something nefarious. And I'll never, ever forget <laughs> out of that meeting, is a, I was I was hoping and I was naive. I was hoping for some kind of apology or some kind of a, an acknowledgement that they had done something wrong, that I should not have been there or whatever. And Zabina turned to me and she said, well, you know, it's good you're going to go because we wouldn't want the org to get in trouble. And I was like, but I've been here for nine months. I told you this thing for nine months. She was worried about the org getting in legal trouble because I was there. When the only reason I was there and continued to be there was because I had no other option to be there, right? So I thought maybe they were like, you know what, Mark, I'm sorry. We should have never put you on staff. You know, we're gonna discipline Helena. We're gonna discipline Surin. We're gonna discipline these people. You're obviously here. You can't really be here. I'm sorry, nothing. They didn't want the org well, to be in trouble. How about even just a, Hey, thanks for everything you've done for the last nine months. We wish you the best. I would have loved that. I would have <laughs> loved that. I would have loved that. I got, you know, I would have loved, yeah, I would have loved something like that. Like, hey, remember when you were the only person in Treasury for weeks on end <laughs> and you didn't speak German? And, uh, you know, yeah, remember, oh, by the way, one, one incident, we actually had an immigration officer come to the org because the German media had found out that they were a number, not just me, but a number of other people, uh, Switzerland, as you mentioned from Sabrina, but we had someone from Bulgaria, we had someone from Kenya, 
we had a bunch of people that didn't have any visas or they were on student visas and they didn't return to their to their homes to then get another visa to come back to Germany. I could have easily walked my ass down there, looked that woman in the eyes and said, I'm from Canada. I'm here illegally. Get me the fuck out of here. I could have contacted Ursula Caberta. I, we, the, the org was a block or two from a police station. There are so many things that I could have done. I knew where the Canadian embassy was. There were so many things I could have done to make, and I should have in the, in the end, to make those morons, you know, go to freaking prison on, you know, uh, immigration law violations. And I was a good Scientologist because I was scared that something bad was going to happen to me. And that was the response. Well, it's good you're leaving because then the York will get in trouble. Thanks. And then Sandy said, you know what? You decided that Berlin wasn't for you, but if you stay, you can do the pure off. And I said, I'm not medically qualified for the pure off. It doesn't matter, Sandy. And she was dumbfounded, like completely dumbfounded. And I cannot tell you how many hours a day I would sit in her office, who's the executive establishment officer, not on my post, staring at her, coming up with these ideas. And I just shaking my head. Like the reality between what they wanted me to do and what was legally possible was so different. Wow. <laughs> it was was un- there unbelievable. Talk, was there any talk or um, about the fact that here you have this uh, Scientology organization in Berlin mm-hmm. and for some reason they can't staff the organ. They don't have enough Scientologists to staff the organization with Germans. Yeah. I mean, I know um, there probably wasn't any talk, but just give me your thoughts on that. Like, did it ever occur to you at the time? Did it seem to occur to anybody at the time that maybe Scientology is not as big as, we're, as, as oh, no. we're being told since we have to bring staff members from Canada who don't speak German? <laughs> and they keep them there because, yeah. Um, you know, no. Um, I do know that it was David Miscavige that decided, and I told you this before, um, the org was supposed to be in Stuttgart, and then he decided it was going to be in Berlin, which was a massive flap. If I had stayed in Stuttgart, Stuttgart actually had a couple of missions, and they had a pretty solid you know, public, and they, they were probably the one city in Germany that actually had a good field. Now, again, not, not a tremendous amount of people, but they did have enough people that if, if the org had been in Stuttgart and stayed in Stuttgart, then it would have there would have been some benefit, I think, to that community in some ways, right? For, maybe for a short period of time. But the hubris of David Miscavige looks to the capital of Germany. Germany hates Scientology, and he wanted to stick it to the German government. And the people that suffered wasn't David Miscavige; it was every staff member, whether they were a good person or not a good person, whether they were the ED or an expediter. It didn't matter. That decision to make Berlin the ideal org and having to take staff from Switzerland, Austria, uh, the Czech Republic was quite a few, um, Stuttgart, Frankfurt, Dusseldorf, Hamburg, and you know other places like Canada and whatever else. Um, there's a guy from Croatia. Um, that, that to me speaks to the level of incompetency when you can just put an org in a place where the org actually had a field and actually had members and actually had staff because a ton of staff members came from Stuttgart. I mean, dozens came from Stuttgart. Like it was already, it was already good there, but no, the fact that he had some, something in his head about Berlin and wanted to, wanted to, to, to build something in Berlin and the belief that if you build it, they will come. You know what I mean? The Field of Dreams moniker. It's just, it, it really was awful. And again, he, he doesn't suffer. I mean, he's still in his multi-million dollar homes and whatever. Um, it was us that suffered because of this logistics problem. It's awful. Why couldn't you just put an ideal organ in Stuttgart and in Berlin? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There had to be one, and it was either Stuttgart or Berlin. And they went with Berlin. I think there might now be an ideal organ in Stuttgart, to be honest. But the first one had to be in the capital. And it had to be in Berlin. And it can, so, yeah, that, that's what it comes down to. In fact, yeah. I can almost guarantee you now that you're, how yeah. you're describing this, I bet they took, because every Scientology organization is supposed to go ideal and buy a new yeah. building. 
So this conversation came down, okay, so for Germany, which city was going to get it first? Yes. And I think uh, the significance of that is they would have taken all of the money that the other orgs in Germany had yeah. raised for their own building mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and funneled that money for the Berlin building. A hundred percent. You know, I remember in the middle of 2006, they actually, you know, that the, the, the live events when they used to show those 3D modeling, those 3D render, renderations of the org, they showed Stuttgart. Now they didn't, they didn't actually buy that particular building that they had showed at the time, but they were proposing that they were going to have this ideal org and the announcer mentioned it was going to be the first in Germany. Again, had they done something like that, they would have at least had the logistics. They would have at least had something. It wasn't going to be flag. It wasn't going to be an AO. It wasn't going to be a St. Hill size thing, but they had the people. They had the field. They actually had field auditors, you know, like from iHelp, field auditors that were in the Stuttgart area, a number of them. Berlin had nothing. Berlin didn't have a Narconon. Berlin didn't have an applied scholastics. We didn't have field auditors. We had nothing. The closest thing that we had was a little Narconon group that met in Dresden or Dresden. And all of those people came up to Berlin. So there was like nothing. There was no field. There was nothing in the north of Germany around Rostock, nothing. So we had to create all of these things. We had a mission, or excuse me, not a mission. We had a test center in the middle of Berlin it closed after two weeks because it was vandalized every day, broken windows, glass, everything. Even an attempt to go outside of the org to do something to bring people in. And Berlin is a rough city. I mean, it's a very, very rough city. There are some areas in Berlin, especially the Eastern Berlin, that you know you get you turn the wrong corner and there's a group of guys and you do get your ass kicked, especially as a Scientologist. When we were out in the book stands, kids would come up to us kick us, throw stuff at us. People would push and shove us all the time. And, you know, it, it was, it was rough. I mean, it was very, very difficult. So like you say, it's the first, the first has to be in the capital. We have to show the German government that we are, you know, surviving and we're progressing and we're expanding. And then it just collapses, you know, like a, a, a house of cards. It was just, it was terrible. Um, but I really wish they had put in Stuttgart. I wouldn't have gone to Stuttgart, but I really wish they had in some cases. It still probably would have failed, but the things that we went through, I guarantee some of them would have still been in there in Stuttgart, the bureaucracy and whatnot, but I think I think it would have been the best, better decision looking back anyway. Yeah. You know, a lot of the heartache and headaches that are part and parcel of the staff and Seorg experience of Scientology have mm -hmm. as their source two things. One, the constant <laughs> unrelenting demand that you get your statistics up. And two, mm -hmm. more importantly, the fact that people aren't getting into Scientology and there's not a yeah. goddamn thing a Seorg member can do about that. But no. in order to get stats up, it requires people actually to be getting into Scientology. So what did you see on the ground in Berlin as far as how many people were getting in, how hard it was to get brand new people in, what did you see? So part of my hat was, or position in the York, I was the director of records, assets, and materials. So I had access to records, which meant records for parishioners and records for staff. So in January of 2008, I was on a project where I had to count how many staff members and how many publics had either blown or, or left staff or whatever, right? Or had just come to the church once to sign up for a course. It totaled about a hundred people had signed up for courses and then did maybe one action, one service and never came back. For staff members, it was about 80. We had 80 staff members as a proportion blue or because they were only getting a couple of euros a week or whatever, 10 euros, 20 euros, they left. So it's 180 people that were just gone. But over what period are you talking about here? That's one year, one year. That was the first year from January 07 until January 08. So it doesn't sound like 200 people or 180 people doesn't sound, 
But you got to think about that. If even half of those people had stayed in, if a quarter of those people had stayed in, it still would have been pretty significant in the world of Scientology. I mean, we had a, number, a good number of staff members, but it was continuing to go down and down and down after each month. So we started with about 140, and there were less than 100 that were on by the time I had left. As far as public... So that's even after the churn. So even, even yes. after churning through 80 staff, yes. you still went, you said from 100 to 40? But, uh, excuse me, 140 to less than 100. We had at one point about 140 when they when they opened the org, and then it was around 110 to 120 by the time I was there. That kept up for a few months, and then it started going below roughly around 100, and then by the time I left in February, it was probably somewhere between 80 and 90. Okay, so then when you talk about um, over a 12-month period, about 100 people mm -hmm. coming in to do a service for the first time yep. and then leaving, so yep. that's the churn. But what yeah. about like the retention? How many people are coming in to do a new course per week during this period, roughly? Um, well, again, uh, it, 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 it was maybe for lucky. I don't know. The most would be maybe five that I remember. That'd be the highest. I, the high, that'd that, be the highest in a week. To, to actually sign up for a class, because also part of the DRM, part of records, is when somebody signs up for a course, they get a bunch of receipts that are colored. And I would get the pink slip, the pink receipt, and I'd have to do a full, create a folder. So yeah, five would be like the absolute most for new courses and new services. It would maybe, maybe be five. I mean, we had a lot of people that had been there for years, of course, who weren't brand new, but that was 20 people, maybe. So, and then again, a lot of people you see one time, they don't, you don't see them again. I got to say five. I got to say that would be the most and probably one or two was average. And that's where I was going to go with this, because yeah. if we take five as a high and Sabrina had said there were many weeks where zero, zero was not uncommon. Oh, zero. If, was we, not take, uncommon. No. if we take an average of two to two point five, that's yeah. already you're you're already only at about 100 people per year coming in that's to right. start a new service. You're yep. churning almost 100 percent of the people who walk in the door. Oh, yeah. I, I, and it's because of the aggressiveness of the staff members. I can tell you incidences where people are so excited. I remember a young couple, they were originally from Iran, but they were living in Germany. They were probably, I was 24 at the time, maybe they were 19 or 20. People were so excited that they were coming in. They came in one time. That was it. They came to do their course in the public course room. They did their two and a half hours. We never saw them again. Um, people don't like the aggressiveness people, they, and everything was very aggressive, of course, because the basics had come out and the cold calling and all this kind of stuff. I was writing letters every week. I was a letter reg first in the Dianetics um, foundation. Then they moved me to, to treasury. The letters that we wrote hundreds and thousands of letters every week. And I got a call again, because I'm the one who was dealing with the bills from the post office to tell us that we had thousands of undeliverable mail in the post office in Germany because we hadn't paid any postage. So people, we would, we would write hundreds of letters and put them to the post office, but we never paid for the postage. So the post office had thousands of outgoing letters to people from all over the world okay, to reg them to get back into Scientology, and they would sit in the post office. Again, Sabrina tells you about, about the, power, the power stuff. That was my job. I was in the bills part. The phone bill, I could tell you about that. It was un freaking believable the incompetence to pay bills. And why? I think because the way it is structured it just doesn't work. The week to week thing. It is so ridiculous. There is not, there's no future planning. It's all week to week to week. And you never know what you're going to make in a week. And everything is assumed that you're making a hundred thousand euros a week. So everything, the whole org board is assumed for the best, but in reality, it's, you always get the worst. So, and then of course it's your fault, right? Um, it's just, it's by design that this thing just doesn't work.
logistically speaking. And it what has was the deal with do... the phone bill? Oh, the phone bill. <laughs> so <laughs> I got a phone bill and it was the size of a phone book. Okay. Remember the old phone books? And it was every call that had been made since the beginning of January until the end of June. And it, I think the total bill was like 20 or 30,000 euros. Like it was insane, this bill. So it was my job to go around and look at every single call that had been made. Okay. Every single one and determine whether or not the org should be paying for it or whether or not a staff member should be paying for it. So if the outgoing call was to Clearwater, Los Angeles, East Grinstead, Copenhagen, okay, or another org, Hamburg or whatever, it's a wash, totally fine. But if I found out that the phone call was going to a private number, a cell phone number or whatever, I was supposed to total those numbers, find out who exactly made the calls, and get them, the staff, to give me money to then pay for the bill. So there was this one gentleman, his name was Peter. He was from the Czech Republic. This gentleman spent hours, literally three, four, five, six hours a night talking to his girlfriend in the Czech Republic, long distance calls. When I calculated how much, I think it was a thousand euros, he basically just left staff. Because why would you? He doesn't have a thousand euros. So he would, be, he would be spending hours on end speaking to his girlfriend. He would, he would do night watch in particular. He would volunteer for a night watch. So he would spend those hours speaking to his girlfriend in the Czech Republic. And again, I think his, his, I totaled it up somewhere around a thousand euros. I approached him. I know he had other issues. I don't think the reason why he left was because of the phone bill. It didn't help. But I remember like saying like, it's a thousand euros. Like this is my, my job is to get this money from you to go into treasury because we cannot afford our phone bill. And shortly after he was gone, completely off staff. So it was th these little things of like, nobody, no, like nobody thought people, staff member were using, were using the phone, like, well, it's paid for, right? Not even that amount of knowledge was given to any of staff members. They just wow. thought, well, well, we can use the phone, right? Someone else will pay for it. <laughs> and then of course the 30,000 euro or something, whatever it was phone bill and how they paid for it. We paid in installments over the next, so just whatever. Just to give people an idea, how many square feet is the ideal org Berlin building? 30,000, 40,000? 47,000, 47,000 square feet. 47,000 square feet. Yep. Guy had about 140 staff in the beginning. That's correct. Uh, can't, can't pay the electric, can't nope. pay the phone bill. The staff members barely making enough to eat. But Miscavige decides, you know what we need? A 47,000 foot building. Which was square foot formerly, formerly a department store that I actually went to in 2005, just randomly. It, uh, and I, it had the, the top floor. Now, remember, um, in Europe, we use our floors differently than in, in North America. So North America, you have the ground floor, then you go to the second floor. In Europe, we do the ground floor, then we go to the first floor. So in Europe, it had six floors. It would be seven in North American standard. So the sixth floor, meaning the top floor, again, in North America, the seventh floor, was like this big kitchen area. They had a cafeteria. It was a great, great, great place. I could not believe that they had bought that building because when it was a department store, it was fantastic. Whatever happened there, who knows, they sold the building. Um, but it was like another world. Like when I walked in for the first time, it looked beautiful. The org itself looks gorgeous. And it is an abs was an absolute disaster. Absolute disaster. The top floor is where the Purif is. Another thing was our water bill. Um, it had showers. So all the staff members would take free showers in the pier of showers because they were sometimes living in apartments with 20 people, as uh, Sabrina told you. And so they couldn't get a shower. The, the line to get a shower would have been two hours. And so people were showering in the showers in the pier of area. So the water bill was extraordinary. 
the cantina or the, the little cafeteria that we had people stole. We lost thousands and thousands of euros in that first year from staff members eating food and not, not being able to pay. It was a nightmare. And especially being in treasury, having to tell people and having to track them down and, and things like this, and then giving the total number of all those losses. Very, very interesting. <laughs> a very interesting job. Um, but yeah, it was a department store. I mean, it had the floors had it, were go- it was gorgeous stuff. Each room was like a different, um, you know, different exhibition, to clothing, and all this kind of stuff in the offices. And he, he it was, it's a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare to clean, to maintain, and of course, David Miscavige. They don't. He doesn't care. Why, why would he? It's just it's for show, for him. Yeah, and you know, it's like when you have a staff that's working a hundred hours a week. You already know, based on you know average income estimates and adjusted mm-hmm. gross income estimates, you already know these people are not making more than fifty to hundred euros a week. Yeah. You would think that the the minimum the org could do to just maybe address staff morale mm-hmm. is provide the snacks for free. Oh, <laughs> and and yeah. instead the staff have to steal the snacks and then be hunted down, and now it's a big deal. And it's like, oh, yeah. they wouldn't be stealing snacks if they were making enough money to fucking eat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was everybody. I mean, there was literally like 50, 60 people were doing this. You can't discipline all of them. And also, even if you discipline someone for stealing snacks, if the reason they're doing it is because mm-hmm. they have to eat, then <laughs> disciplining them doesn't accomplish anything. Oh. They still have to eat. Like, what are they... What's the solution? Don't eat? <laughs> well, that was a solution for a few of us. I went plenty of days without eating. Um, you know, it wasn't good, but I had to. Um, I know Sabrina mentioned too, it got really bad that the Sea Org members, most of which were Hungarian, by the way, started to buy food and started to cook for us. But we still had to eat. We still had to pay two euros. That was the, the least it was going to be was two euros. And the stuff they cooked was disgusting. Okay, I was so hungry one day that I had gone down there and they had made um, schnitzel, but they had used beef liver, cow's liver schnitzel. I'm not a fan of liver. I think it's to me, it's disgusting. And I don't like it at all. And they had schnitzel this beef liver and I probably ate three or four portions because people were just giving it to me. Someone would take a bite. They go, oh, Mark, Mark will take it. I'd eaten four portions of this effing beef liver. And then my stomach started to feel a little rumbly and it came out the other way. And then I continued to eat two more servings because that was literally the only thing that I ate that whole day. And it was, it was atrocious. The food situation also, when we won the birthday game, they would cater for us for the birthday game. They give us KFC and stuff. I have never seen human beings rush a table full of food outside of the outside of farm footage of pigs running to a trough. People were elbowing each other to get fried chicken and pizza. Um, it, it was it was disgusting. Like it, it, it's it was awful the way that they treat people. And it literally was like we were winning the birthday game and still people hadn't eaten in days. The big, it literally is the biggest fucking scam. <laughs> the birthday picture, game. If you've ever seen people oh. act like a horde of animals, you've never been in yeah. a cafeteria on dessert night. There, there, there you go. There you go. As I said, it's, yeah. But to think of a bunch of Germans oh. and Czechs and Poles fighting over KFC, that is a hell of a thing. KFC to imagine. pizza, like, and, and I, I got very smart. So, for some reason, the org, and I don't know, they never came from Treasury, but whenever there was an event, Aaron, they would cater for 250 people. 20 people would show up. I would do night watch, and I would spend the night eating those little fancy sandwiches. And I would volunteer. I'd be like, no, I want to do night watch tonight. Like, I'm doing night watch tonight. It's an it would be me, my the, whoever the partner was, usually my roommate, because my roommate caught on to it. And I would be like, dude, we can eat. We can eat 
I probably ate 50 of those little fancy sandwiches after like, I think it was the auditor's day in September. And we're just eating, eating, eating. And then the CERC members would come down and they go, all these people are so stupid. Why aren't they doing night watch? And I was like, don't tell anybody. Like, this is my thing. Like I'm doing night watch after an event because I'm eating. And then Christmas came up, the Christmas, they had a turkey and all this kind of stuff. I stayed up the whole night eating the food and everyone was gone. I'm like, what the hell is wrong with these people? They want to go home and I'm eat- I ate for 10 hours <laughs> with my roommate. And we were just smiling. Oh. Like we were the ha- we were like the, the greatest people. We're like the smartest people in the room. We're like idiots. What do they do? They're going home. They're oh. going to starve. And we're eating turkey and drinking oh, beer. Man. The beer and cheese oh. party, the fondue party. Every time they had a party, I'm like, I'll do my watch. <laughs> like, I ate fondue for a whole night. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. It's, it's insane. It was insane. Just the, the animalistic nature of people who are starving. That that that's something I got to tell you. <laughs> that oh is my gosh. so funny. I know. And then so, <laughs> we're winning the birthday game too. So whatever. Wow. So <laughs> for the nine months that you were, um, in, or the six months, six or nine months that you were in Germany, is there anything? Nine months. Nine months. Yeah the nine months you were there because really when you went to san francisco it was like what a couple weeks uh, it was 10 weeks so two and a half months 10 weeks okay yeah so is there anything else particularly noteworthy or remarkable or anything you'd like to discuss about that time in berlin uh well again sabrina did touch on this but the, the tom cruise story i always thought was very interesting because there was really a morale uh deflation after that because um, you know, Tom Cruise is shooting Valkyrie. He's, you know, one of the richest people, most successful actors in the world. And we get wind that he's going to come. He's in Berlin. He had been apparently in an apartment not too far from the org that he had rented the whole Katie Holmes thing, whatever. I think the thing about that is we were, again, not only were we taken off post, but we were told we could meet him. And I think I think the the naiveness of some of the staff, not to blame the staff members, but I could not imagine someone like Tom Cruise coming through an org, even if it was in the evening, and shaking hands with over 100 people on staff. There is no way that his security people would have let him do that. So when I heard that, I was immediately skeptical. I thought to myself, there is no way that... Tom Cruise's bodyguards, Tom Cruise's PR, his entourage, his PR people are going to allow that because you never know if someone's got a knife. You never know if someone's going to be deranged for his own safety, going around an org, even a Scientology org to shake the hands of a hundred plus people. And so I, I had also, um, when I went to college, I, I studied film and broadcasting and I did an internship with a company called Deluxe. And we used to have high profile clients that used to come in there to do post-production sound and picture stuff. So, you know, something called ADR, basically. And ADR, of course, is when you read lines after the fact to sort of match it up to lines that an actor is saying. It's called additional dialogue replacement, a little bit like looping. I'm sure Lee has done a ton of it and and so on. Um, So I knew that you don't just have massive groups of people together with someone who's got a high profile. I knew this. I had had this, you know, Woody Harrelson came into Deluxe one time and he was nice, but people had to leave, you know? So even him, even a nice, cool guy like him who didn't care how many people there were there, there's still an air air of safety for that particular person. And there are people who are getting paid hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars a year to make sure that Tom Cruise is alive and well. Okay, so I buried it out of my mind. But when we were told to leave, and then later the next day, when the ED was going around the org, I met Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is so nice, you know, gloating about this. That uh, that really, 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 the morale went down. It went absolutely down there. People quit staff. People were kicked off staff because we were not allowed to tell anybody that Tom Cruise was coming. And of course, people told their, you know, someone told their family members. And 
since then, in my opinion, the org had not recovered. People were very angry. They were very skeptical. And they really started to mistrust a lot of what was going on. The difference, though, was they were blaming Berlin. The idea was it wasn't a Scientology thing. It was that Berlin was a bad org, that someone in the exec committee or whatever was probably a, an SP or PTS, but it was only in Berlin. Berlin was bad. Berlin was terrible. But the rest of the Scientology world was good, even, even though it was, in my opinion, just a public relations thing of why Tom Cruise can't meet 100 plus people. And the safety thing as well. What had you guys been promised? What What are we talking about here? So we were promised that if we clean the org, we were off post and clean the org for two straight days. We were going to get together in on our posts. So wherever we were posted to, and Tom Cruise was going to have a tour of the building, and he was going to stop off in every office and every place, come around, shake our hands you know, look us in the eyes and basically thank us. That's what people were saying, that we would we would have to be in our offices, at our posts, like a PR thing, doing work. Tom Cruise was going to come in. We were going to meet him. We're going to shake his hand. And again, he was probably going to give us some little motivational speech or whatever, and then he'd go on to the next office. That was it. He, we were supposed to be there when he was coming in to do his tour. Very interesting. That, that and just idea. to make sure I'm crystal clear on this, yeah. is it, hey, guys, if you guys get this org with them into shape, your reward will be Tom Cruise will come and thank every one of you for doing such a great job being super Scientologists. Or was it, hey, guys, Tom Cruise is scheduled to come by. He's coming by to meet and thank all of you. And therefore, we are going to be spending the next two days getting this org into white glove shape. Which one was, was the it? first? The first. Really? Yeah. So it was almost like Tom Cruise coming was going to be the reward for oh, yes. getting this building spick and span. Yep. Oh, that's different than what I thought from the last conversation. Because I thought it was I thought it was urgent, urgent. Tom Cruise is coming. We have two days to clean the place, but it wasn't that. Maybe I'm sorry, maybe I'm mis misunderstanding. I apologize for that. It was kind of both in a sense. We knew that Tom Cruise was going to come. Then the people from Tom Cruise's entourage or PR had sort of said he's coming in this window of a couple days. We don't know when exactly. And then we were told to clean the org. And then it would be our reward for cleaning the org that we would also meet Tom Cruise. So again, apologize if I misunderstood anything. Um, no, no, that helps a but lot. It was, it was kind of like, this is, because again, nothing was definite. We didn't know definitely when he was going to come. And from what I understood, when he did come, they gave, again, like a small window. Like he had, he had been on break from filming Valkyrie. And so they put him in a car. And he came to the org. He saw the org. So when he came was not like it's going to be, because I think it was at like 11 or 12 o'clock at night on a particular day. We didn't know that, but we knew that he was sort of in the area and that he would be coming at a undisclosed amount of time. And so as we were cleaning, as we were getting everything together, then it was like, okay, now he's coming. Everyone gets out of the York, except for like five people. And those are the people, Roman, Lucas, I believe were there, the Kristen Austinat, Sabina Weber, and possibly one or two more people. And they were the ones that did the tour. So, so we, they, apologies, no, just no definitive, like he's coming on this day. That was more open. And so to frame it a little further, this was after um, Tom Cruise had already been awarded his, his IAS Freedom Medal of Valor by yeah. David Miscavige. <laughs> this is after mm -hmm. he stood up there on stage and said to all the Scientologists how important it is to be dedicated and we're counting on you and COB is counting on you and I'm counting on you and LRH is counting on you and mm -hmm. we're counting on you. So having Tom Cruise come by at this time wasn't just, hey, it's a famous Scientologist. This was oh, almost no. akin to David Miscavige himself coming and thanking yeah. each one of you. And, and you know, we had an IAS reg office on the first floor and outside that office, they had a, a television. I must have seen that 
Tom Cruise Medal of Valor clip 50 to 100 times. It was constantly on all the time on that first floor and people would be eating their lunches on their breaks and we would watch that spastic turtleneck and clapping and, and looking completely off balance. I must have seen that clip at, at least 50 times. That thing, I probably saw it in one day three or four times. When we were at Night Watch, we would go up to watch it because it was an hour or whatever, just to kill time. And that clip, when it came out with Anonymous, I was like, yeah, I've seen this clip hundreds of times. What's wrong with it? And then I'm like, oh, that's what's wrong with it. <laughs> oh, now I know what's wrong with it because now I'm not thinking like a Scientologist and I'm not thinking he's doing a tone scale thing or he's whatever. Oh, he just did OT7 or whatever. I'm thinking like, this guy is nuts. Like this, this is, this is emotional unstab instability um, and his ups and downs and his, you know, seriousness and then his laughing manically. Um, and I remember a friend of mine was like, when that, when that first came out with Anonymous and a friend emailed me and I was like, again, I was like, yeah, so what? And then it took a couple of times to be like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so just an anecdote on that, that that particular clip was viewed so many times by staff members as motivation. So wow. yeah, when he, when he comes in, when it's Tom Cruise was coming in, that was less than three years that he had done that, right? That clip was, I guess, October-ish of 2004, because the October event, I guess, is the St. Hill event. So this was less than this maybe two and a half years, two and three quarter years. And everyone who was a second gen, everyone who wasn't a second gen, Tom Cruise. Him coming, like you say, second to David Miscavige. And in some people's mind, maybe even first to David Miscavige. I know to my roommate who had been in Scientology for 10 years at that time, he didn't care. We had a, we had a little thing about maybe, maybe David Miscavige would come in. Okay, that was nice, but this is Tom Cruise. Like this is, this is something different, you know? So all the staff get screwed at the last minute. They're told, get out of the building. Tom's coming. Oh, yeah. And the next day, the ED is so freaking tone deaf that she's running around gloating about having met Tom to everyone who just got screwed. Everybody. And my roommate, David, was so angry <laughs> that he actually, um, he said something very sarcastic. Again, because speaking German, it was hard for me to, to really, but he told me later what he was saying. But as she was gloating, he was so ang like angry. And I can, again, I knew that there were these logistical issues that, that wouldn't work, but that's just me. They were expecting that and people were unbelievably angry. We also had a staff meeting, um, I guess a few days later, sometime later, and people were standing up, they were yelling, they were screaming and the whole exec people just dismissed it. Like, well, that, that's just how it was. It's Tom Cruise. He's a big famous person. And, you know, don't blame us and whatever. And again, a few people left staff. They felt very hurt. And from then, morality down, down, down. That was relatively now getting into August of 08. So it was like June or July of 08. And then from August, September, straight downhill as far as morality. People started um, not going on a full, full-time course uh, well, people stopped, uh, you know, people were, who were supposed to be in for 90 hours a week would come in for maybe 10 or 20 hours a week. And then people just disappeared. Um, it was really, it was really strange. I mean, I, and I don't, I don't um, begrudge those people, obviously, um, because they were lied to, regardless of the fact that my little knowledge of what, you know, client relations is like in, in, a, in a film company um, was just different, different perspective. But uh, yeah, lie to completely. It was completely awful. So at the staff meeting, did the execs offer up a reason for why the plans changed at the last minute? No, not that I recall. Again, being in German, there there may have been, but I always had someone to translate for me, like my friend, like my roommate David, or someone else. And from what I just recall, they were just pushing the blame onto other sources, and that was it. I don't think they really gave a clear, concise answer. I think it was more like, well, Tom Cruise came, you should be happy. The org was clean, so you should be happy. Um, the ED was still gloating, so you should be happy. Um, 
And I don't think there was ever, there wasn't anything ever resolved. I mean, people were still angry weeks after, months after. And then of course, life takes over and people start to sort of forget about it. But it was, it really rocked, I think, the, the morale in the org for at least, a, at least after that period onwards. So after sort of the late summer and into the fall and the winter, which were not great. Uh, <laughs> not great. You know, so. one thing that occurs to me that um, is really unfortunate, but also quite likely, is that it's very possible Tom not only never agreed to do what everyone was promising he was going to do, course, but was probably course. never even informed that the staff were even yeah. told that this is what they were, what was being going to happen. Agreed. Agreed. I agree with that 100%. The other thing, too, is they, uh, him and Kitty Holmes eventually, I think, like, after they brought like a uh, flowers, like a really, really big, massive pot, plot of flowers with like a thank you card. So for me, I, I, I 100% agree. Just the way that communication is run in that kind of a situation, Tom Cruise probably has next to no power, especially when he's on a film set, of his own schedule. He was probably told that morning or even that afternoon, we've got a little window of opportunity from from filming Valkyrie. So he would have gone off of Valkyrie at a certain time and he would have had this window of opportunity and he would have gone there. Like you say, I don't think he would have known at all. There's there's no way. And especially, I don't think that he would have known that he was disappointing so many people because even though you know um, he's a Scientologist and whatever, I do know people um, who work with celebrities or assistants and stuff, because I lived in Los Angeles for a couple of years. And usually most celebrities, if they're in a position where they can sign some stuff, like most like to do it, most like to interact with their fans to some level, there needs to be some security. But a lot of people will do that. Like if they know that there's like a hundred fans, you know, Benedict Cumberbatch is one person I knew, uh, someone who was an assistant of his. He likes to meet as many fans as he can. There's also, Vin Diesel does this. There's a lot of people who do this. Even if it's 100 people, they want to go out and sign. They want to meet their fans. They want to take selfies. They want to look their fans in the eyes because they're so grateful. Not everyone's like this. 100% not everyone's like this. But there are so many people that will do that. And I think Tom Cruise leans towards that. I've, I've been told at least when he's at public events, he tries to sign pictures and take selfies of as many people as he possibly can. Most, many actors like to do that. They'd like to engage with their fans. So by him, by someone in his entourage, let's say, not informing him of that because they didn't know something maybe that the executives in Berlin concocted that they never brought to his PR people, that to me also is pretty likely. So I don't blame Tom Cruise, right? I know from that prior experience in the film industry, what it's like, what their schedules are like. I 100% blame the people that concocted the story, which I strongly believe was the execs and CERC members in Berlin. And they were doing that to motivate us simply to clean the org. And they could have said, listen, they could have been honest. And maybe they just thought people would be would move faster if they knew that they were going to meet Tom Cruise. I don't know. Again, never, we never got any resolution on that. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. So by the time, was anything else in Berlin that's particularly noteworthy you wanted to talk about? Just one other thing, because I, um, I was in Treasury. So in December of 2007, um, one of the Sea Org members came up to me with a paper bag filled with euros and said, um, this bag of money is for the IAS office in Copenhagen. You are going to take the bus from Berlin to Copenhagen to deliver this paper bag full of money to the uh, IAS office in Copenhagen. And I thought that was really peculiar that the org had actually been taking people, Germans, they would take the bus at night from Berlin to Copenhagen to give money, okay, money from the IAS, from the IAS Berlin to the IAS in Copenhagen. And a couple of times prior, the Germans were getting asked, right, 
why are you here? What are you doing? And there was some suspicion because there had been the same person and the same group of people had been delivering this cash, like physical cash. So then, because I have a Canadian passport, I was selected to drop off this cash. And it was somewhere around six or 7,000 euros in a paper bag. And I went up to Copenhagen to deliver this cash. And I always thought that that was very, very strange that I, because normally when you enter from a different country, you got to pay taxes and duties and stuff like this, but that they were basically running thousands and thousands of euros from one IAS office to the, to the next, and that they were getting kind of suspicious about it. And then they left it to me and they paid for my bus ticket. I wasn't able to stay. So all I did was I took a night bus overnight to Copenhagen. So something like six to eight hours. I went from the bus station. I walked to uh, the CLO, uh, CLO base, AO, AO base in Copenhagen. They gave me 20 euros for food. And I took the, the bus, the next bus back to Berlin. And it was just to give money, cash, not correct, nothing, physical cash, including banknotes and coins to go from IAS to IAS. And I did that and I, I just, I always thought that was really bizarre. And the, the idea was that they, they didn't want to, for some reason, they didn't want to transfer it through the bank or they couldn't transfer it through the bank because German banks are always very suspicious and it was a large amount. And it, they told me a bunch of stuff if I get stopped by police and border and like to act stupid. And that because I had a Canadian passport, no one, no one would, no one would say anything. And they didn't. So that that was just very interesting. <laughs> How are you supposed to act stupid about a paper bag full of seven thousand euros? What did they tell me to say? Um, I can't even remember. You know, you're not supposed to take over ten thousand, I think, euros or something across the border. But then again, they're part of the EU. Like nothing, nothing. It was sketchy. Put it that way. Nothing made sense in this whole endeavor. But they were they were telling me like, oh, you know, it's my money, and I work as a I work in volunteer, and to basically being vague. Like I'm not going to say, oh, I'm a staff member from Scientology. But oh, I work for a nonprofit, and I'm going to another nonprofit, and this is, you know, we we have an organization, and we can't really wire transfer right now because we have problems with computers or whatever. So I, it's my job. I'm gonna, you know, go from this nonprofit organization in Berlin to this other nonprofit organization in Copenhagen. I'm just giving this money. I don't really even know where it comes from necessarily. Like just to get off the fact that it's two Scientology orgs. It was, it was this rigmarole that I was supposed to say. It was really, really bizarre. And it was just like, I did it once and that was it, but it was, it was weird. <laughs> it was really Were weird. you specifically told not to say Scientology? Oh yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It has nothing to do with Scientology. Even though again, the moment I got off the bus, at Copenhagen, I walked to the Copenhagen uh, AO, and I specifically asked, I guess it's for the, the IASICEU, so the, the International Association of Scientologists in charge in Europe. And she, she was a young woman, I think she was German, and I asked for her at the reception, she came down, we transferred it, um, and then I left. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, like, who it was so who in Berlin? Sorry, who in Berlin asked you to do the delivery? So that was the ED who was Irmi at the time, and it also went through. I think I remember maybe Cornelius was there. Definitely, no, that's Rome, fine. I just wanted to establish I'm sorry, I'm because. Sorry, I'm sorry. Well, no, no. I mean, that's, I just wanted to establish that it wasn't yeah. even the IAS rep who asked right. you to do this. And I just wanted, no. the only reason I wanted to establish that is because yeah. the IAS as a legal entity mm -hmm. does not have anything to do with the Church of Scientology International. That's right. And the Church of Scientology in Berlin is an organization that is its own LLC or corporation, yep. I'm sure, but is licensed mm -hmm. by the Church of Scientology International. The IAS exists as this separate organization mm -hmm. that legally mm -hmm. speaking, 
has nothing to do with the Church of Scientology International. And yet a staff member of CSI is the one asking another staff member of CSI mm -hmm. to do a cash run for the IAS. And this is where sure. things get just legally interesting. So we did have, for example, an IAS rep for like the first few months, but that person went off staff. So, cause we had like a whole IAS reg office and, and whatnot, as I mentioned on the first floor. Um, so that, that person went off staff. He had a big blow up with the executives left. So all the IAS stuff was just left to treasury. So we had a lot to do with it and also Div 7. So a lot of the times the EU and some of the exec staffs were over it because I think the IAS reg is part of Div 2. So then I think, or is it maybe part of Div 6? I can't remember um, the Div org six. board. It's Div 6. Okay. So that makes sense because it's in the Div 6 area. But that's but the other place where it gets regardless. legally in. But that's yeah. the other place where it gets legally interesting is because yeah. you do have on a Scientology org board mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm. a position that is rarely filled, but more often these days, whose job it is to raise money for the IAS, even though the yeah. IAS is a separate entity. That's right. So that gets interesting. So right. were you specifically told, though, that this money was local IAS money? Oh, yes. Yeah, I know. It was it was people who had donated for their lifetime memberships and also from other other straight donations to the IAS. And it had it had not they had not done a run in a few months because they were getting suspicious when this other staff member was going like every couple months. And so it was it was hard cash that the people had donated. But those donations would never have been made in cash in the first place. It would have always been check or credit card. So they would have had to go to the bank make yeah. a cash withdrawal just mm -hmm. to take a six hour bus ride to Copenhagen to give it to them. That's weird. I, I, and I couldn't tell you because the IS stuff we never dealt with in treasury. I might, I can tell you about paying bills. I can tell you about bank reconciliations and just trying to keep our fucking accounts in order, but the IS was a different beast. And so you're right. If it was a treasury thing, we had cash on hand and we also, you know, dispersed cash a lot. Um, and we had to pay bills. Of course, sometimes we did pay with cash or sometimes we, we mostly was check. But yeah, I couldn't tell you what the IS. The IS was a totally different beast. And I, it was just bizarre, as I can say. And I did the cash run, went there, went back, and then nobody talked about anything. They just said, did this person get the cash? I said, yeah, give it to this person in their hand. They went upstairs. I left. It was just wow. odd. And it was because Canadian passport. <laughs> <laughs> I had my mom said, why didn't, why didn't you take the cash, take a flight to like Switzerland, open a bank account and come home? And I was like, well, why would I do that? Like, I mean, I hated being there, but why would I do that? And she was like, because they're paying you nothing. And, you know, you could have easily just come home. What would, what would they have known? And I'm like, yeah, but it was IS money. Like, it, I was so in the other world of like, this could have been my ticket out if I was nefarious, <laughs> but yeah, whatever. Yeah. I'm actually glad That's I not didn't how people do that. think. I mean, Scientologists I are in there for a reason. No one's no, no one's yeah. in there trying to figure out how to screw the entire organization. That's, that's what I'm saying. Um, yeah. but whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So eventually, so you go, you, you go to San Francisco, you have that 10 week experience there. They yep. base Steve Latch essentially fitness boards you off of staff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then absolutely. does your entire Scientology experience end right there, or does it carry on for a bit? So um, I went to Los Angeles, and I spent about three or four nights in Los Angeles. Again, Los Angeles is kind of a special city because I—that's where I joined Scientology. That's where I decided to join the Berlin Org. It's where I left Scientology, and then less than a year after I left Scientology, I moved there for college. Spent a number of years there. I got to meet Graham Barry, the late great Gary Scarf, uh, sorry, Chrisman, a lot of, you know, the Headleys, a lot of people. So it's very, very, uh, that city is very important to me. But during this time, which was in, in May of 2008, um, right across from Asho, the Asho building, there's like those houses that are on, are on Hubbard Way. So this particular house is a brown house. It's owned by a Scientologist and she boards Scientologists that are doing AO or, or, OSHA or, or ASHO courses. So I stayed in that particular house, like kind of like, again, like a boarding house. And what my purpose was, and I was there for four or five days, was to get an answer as to 
number one, why was I kicked off staff? What was the actual answer or what, what was the reason? What could I do if I wanted to get back on staff, which I did get some answers on that, but mainly I wanted to tell and give my, give my side that I had already been a staff member for nine months. I had amazing amounts of, of issues. I wanted to tell the people in Los Angeles Specifically, I wanted to talk to the international justice chief, which I don't even know if there is such a thing. I wanted to sit down with that person and have them explain to me these procedures, these things. I was basically just given the, the, the rigmarole, like, it doesn't really matter. We don't care what's going on in Berlin. Berlin is winning the birthday game. I'm sure there's a good reason why, you know, this happened or that happened. They were just giving me no answers and they were giving me like a, you know, like the rigmarole, like they were just, they were not answering my questions. And I was feeling very, very like, what the fuck did I just do for a year? Like, what, what was I doing for a year? Like, what was, what was the purpose? And these people don't even want to know that there's, you know, staff members were illegal and I'm getting blamed and my visa issues, like no, just nobody cared. And so I just remember just deciding um, the day before I left, I just decided, you know what, I think I'm done with Scientology. And so I, I left, I decided to leave. Um, and then when I came home the next day, I flew back from Los Angeles to Toronto. And I remember shortly after I returned, I was in, in the bank, you know, in the mall, and I got a call on my flip phone and it was from someone from Clearwater. And somehow, I don't know why, but somehow, I guess when I was talking with someone in Los Angeles, I think I might have mentioned leaving or something like that, like some offhanded comment. And this person was really, really aggressive, telling me, I can't leave. I'm in it already. Um, you have no choice. Like... You know, this is your eternity. This is your future. Go back to the Toronto org. You just have to do an um, A to E steps. You have to do your overts. You, ha you have to do this. You have to do this. You have to do this. And I just said, you know, you like this is a CRC member. And I was like, you don't, I don't really want to do that anymore. And I was trying to explain, like, I just want to, I want to move on with my life. I've had a lot of bad experiences and I want to move on. And again, I felt incredibly ignored in the same way that I had felt incredibly ignored the week before when I was in Los Angeles. It was just go back. Yeah, you have problems, but just go back into the church. No reason, no explanation. Um, the same thing with, uh, with the meeting with uh, Sabrina and Sandy. Everything I was trying to say ignored. The, you know, I had no right to leave Scientology. I had no, I had no right to question people. And... After that, I got a series of emails and a series of phone calls from mostly from Clearwater, Los Angeles, nothing from Germany, nothing from Berlin. And then, as I said, I was already mentally out. And over the next few months, it was pretty bad in the sense that a lot of the fears were coming back and a lot of the anxieties were coming back. Um, but eventually I started writing my story, started in September of 2008 finished in February of 2009. And I, as I was writing, and I uh, had a journal also in, in Berlin where I was writing down my daily activities. And I was, I was writing and as other ex-members were, um, were commenting, like Jeffrey Augustine was one, one of the early commenters. I felt that they were listening to me, that they were acknowledging the things that, they, that I had gone through and that it was okay to feel this way. And that had not been a part of anything for the past three years. It was always my fault. It was always something else that I could have done. It was always, I'm not good enough. I'm never gonna be an OT. I'm a total piece of crap. And the ex members like Jeffrey and Karen eventually, Karen de la Carriere, they were listening to me. And then I started making friends with people who were ex spouses of people that I worked with and on and on and on. And I started to develop that idea that this is not, it's not just me. Mine might have been a bit more unique because I'm Canadian and went to Berlin or whatever, but thousands of people have very similar stories. And also that there are worse stories out there with this connection and, and deaths and, and horrible things that happen to people when they're in Scientology. So 
it really then solidified by a year later um, in 2009 that I was, I was out and I was protesting, went to some anonymous protests in Los Angeles. And from there, I really haven't looked back. So I've been lucky in that way. Um, but really the, the, the not being heard, the, 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 this my fault, doesn't matter. You didn't make it go right. Um, that really, that that really was one of the one of the cruxes of why I decided to leave. <laughs> well, fascinating stuff. Really fascinating stuff. Uh, is there anyone else you're in touch with other than Sabrina from uh, your Berlin days? There is. I don't. I don't really know if I'm a, if I should say the person's name. Just oh, no, because you don't I don't know to. what their you stuff. Yeah, but th there is. A, there was a gentleman, a younger gentleman, um, whom I actually when I went back to Berlin in 2018 and was with the anonymous we did a little protest he came and I hadn't again seen him at that point for 10 years so he's gone I know that there's a number of people that are gone that were on staff um they just haven't come out like myself or Sabrina um so three of us that I know of including myself and I'm really hoping that like these interviews and stuff that Sabrina is doing Will allow more people to come out um, of the woodwork as well, and I, I really hope that happens when those people are comfortable and ready. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, talk to you soon. Bye. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see a, a different one of my videos, uh, oh, yeah, my love, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe right here.